casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, October 21st, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Washington Bureau Chief of the Intercept, host of CounterPoints, co-host of CounterPoints, Ryan Grimm will be with us. Specifically, in part, to talk about his piece on APAC and its allied super PAC crushing progressive challengers this past cycle. Then we'll be talking to Ben Dixon on the ground in Mississippi, covering the case of Jaheim McMillan, teen shot in the head by the cops then give them a revolution that's right ben burgess and jason miles will be here talk about their super group show happening this weekend in los angeles that will include our very own matt leck that is a crossover episode for the oh, yeah. ages mm -hmm. meanwhile top headline rob schneider says he's had it with the democratic party oh no he's gonna become a republican reno yeah that's not really the top headline steve bannon gets four months in prison and uh, owes a fine for his contempt charges republican lawsuits in attempts to stop student debt relief all shut down by the courts no standing New report, Trump's stolen documents had classified secrets about the Iranians and Chinese governments. And a Trump-appointed New York federal judge blocks New York State's ban on guns in places of worship. Georgia early voting continues to break records. Meanwhile, Nevada polls sound an alarm. Catherine uh, Cortez Masto down by two points. Cisco in Syracuse is the food services company, not the computer computer technology company. Uh, in Syracuse, Boston, and Arizona, win their strike. Meanwhile, teachers in Haverhill, Mass, settle their strike after four days. And North Carolina Republican senatorial candidate Ted Budd apparently got a low-cost personal loan and campaign cash after pushing for a bank merger that ended up costing North Carolinians thousands of jobs. That comes from Lever News. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the program, folks. It is Casual Friday. As you can see, I am wearing my soft collared shirt. Emma Viglin's here. Not even bear, bear, no, bothering to wear. No collar. Uh, this is my resistance uh, for the show. So I don't even know what Do you wear collars? On. No, yeah. not really. I mean, I, the, I, I have to differentiate myself somehow from you. There you go. Uh, you're not wearing glasses today, so that helps. That, no, not that today. Helps. No. Uh, two quick IMs just because uh, they caught my eye. Clown Shoe Mike says, please talk about Mike Itkus, the independent candidate running mm. against Jerry Nadler. I'll buy a tushy if you do, please. <laughs> um, you know, I meant to get to this. Uh, my friend uh, John Benjamin has been sending me uh, images of uh, Mike Itkus's work. He um, is 
getting out ahead of a sex tape that is apparently out there. Wow. Of him. He's running for, for office uh, in New York uh, City. He is in favor of... Um, he, I can't try. Um, he's in favor of uh, of of of, ma of sex outside of marriage. Yeah. So this sex tape, this was leaked on purpose for publicity, right? I I don't know. That never um, happens. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I haven't seen the uh, sex tape. I've only seen uh, images from the sex tape. Thanks to my I friends. I think that's what that's, he's uh, claiming. I, I think Itkis is claiming that it was it was for campaign purposes, but you know. That he did it for campaign yeah. purposes. Uh, I mean, yeah. well, at least he's being transparent. It's a good use of campaign funds. Um, you know, I need to do more research on that before I comment any before further. Before so, we air uh, it. Just, yeah. <laughs> uh, Vermont Ben, how serious should we take the Federalist piece on further aggressive radicalization of the right? Um, you should not not take it too seriously. I'm going to get into that on probably on Monday or Tuesday. We'll talk about it. I don't know if you saw this piece in the Federalist where they finally basically come out of the closet, as it were, and say, we've got to stop calling it the conservative movement. Now, this was an argument I was making in 2004 when Andrew Sullivan was talking about conservatism. Um, I mean, it was basically talking about conservatism in the same way that one might say that, like, oh, I'm going to try and revive Latin. <laughs> as a, a, you know, the language still exists, but it is not, it is a, it is a dead language. And, um, of course, that's what conservatism is. It is really just a, it's reactionaries. They're reactionaries and um, revanchists. But we, we'll get into it. I mean, at the very least, they're, they're coming out and saying, like, let's not pretend anymore. Let's just go full on to the uh, fascism. Um, we'll get more into that. But uh, speaking of someone who's been trying to stir up a little bit of fascism around the globe oh it's his proud project yes He's trying to start a fascism university in europe basically. Well, one of the funny things too uh speaking of fascism is that uh berlusconi uh the former prime minister of uh of italy who was you know certainly fashy um in his own way uh part of the coalition that has brought in uh prime minister maloney Apparently, uh, tapes have, have come out where he has um, expressed uh, solidarity uh, with uh, Putin and uh, undercuts a little bit of Maloney's claims hmm. to uh, be against Russian aggression in uh, Ukraine. So uh, we'll see how that turns out. But uh, one of the guys who undoubtedly has been working with folks like that, if not those folks. Um, oh, no, they're buddies, yes. Maloney and Steve Bannon. Here is uh, Steve Bannon walking into the courtroom this morning. Unbeknownst to him, he was going to walk out of this courtroom a couple hours later with a verdict that he spent four months in jail and also uh, owe some uh, fines for his contempt of Congress. How you doing, brother? Traitor! 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 Thank you, ma'am. I want to thank all you guys Traitor! for coming. Remember, Traitor! this Traitor! illegitimate regime, is, their, their judgment Traitor! day is this on is 8 it. November Traitor! when the Biden administration Traitor! ends. I want to thank you all for Traitor! coming. Thanks. By the way, and remember, take down the CCP. Thank you. Yeah, well, he's going to appeal it, apparently. Um, I'd imagine that he'll be in some sort of cushy, low-security situation and maybe get out within two months, even though the sentence is four. And then he'll get what he wanted, which was uh, some sort of political martyrdom for his fascist project. But it's still good to see him taken down a peg, at least if, even if it's temporarily. Well, I mean, it is important, I think, on some level, if Congress calls you uh, to mm -hmm. testify, that you be um, required to testify in particular. I mean, I'm not a big fan of, of, uh, of prison or people going to prison necessarily, although I am certainly willing to make certain exceptions in certain cases. No, um, I'm not entirely against it. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, let's be clear. I mean, I uh, maybe in a in a broader sense, in practice, there are some people who I would like to put in some form of jail for a long, long time. 
He's one of them. There are others. Um, but I've wished worse things on, well, arguably worse people. So uh, there it is. Steve Bannon. Bye-bye. Meanwhile, uh, we're going to be talking to Ryan Grimm. I don't know. Bannon seemed to think that it would end the Biden administration on November 8th. Of course, Biden's not running for re-election if he does for another two years. So, um, well, I mean, but that's when uh, the installation of Donald Trump happens. You haven't it's been just like a millennial on cult. Chan. I mean, come on, mm. you don't understand. This is when right. Q's about to strike. Exactly. It's like it's a millennial cult. It's just the next date, they'll just punch, push it, keep pushing it back. I know. Exactly. It. Right. Um, we're going to be talking to uh, Ryan Grimm in uh, just a moment or two uh, about uh, his piece. Uh, today's program sponsored by one of my favorite sponsors sunsetlakesebede.com uh if you use the coupon code left is best you get 20 percent off my sister called me and she's like those thsa sebede gummies they have them uh, with just a 0.3 i think it is of thsa um which of course is legal you can ship that across the country she said she got like leveled by them. <laughs> they're good, and they they taste like mango or something. I know like that's that. the problem I have with gummies. It's like I like uh, at one point I lose sight that I they're know. actually not. They're not. It's not just something to eat. Right. Uh, that's why I got to stay away from edibles of all sorts. But if you're one of those people who can actually uh, measure yourself, you got to try those out. They're fantastic. Of course, they have the sour uh, cebed cebede gummies. The, that they've had for a long time. And they have sleep gummies that are elderberry with some melatonin in them. Those are great. I can I can eat those and just have one or two. Uh, but I also use the uh, CBD tincture uh, for sleeping and for just generally calming down. My kids are driving me crazy. Also, uh, sometimes after a meal, I'll have a, a CBD smokable. They have pre-rolls. They got these big blunt things. They got keef. They got uh, flour. Uh, you should check it out. Of course, they also have fudge. They have Sebede infused coffee. Uh, they have uh, Sebede lotion. And they also have a great salve that has Arnica in it that um, I repeatedly will get emails from people saying, gave it to my grandmother. She swears by it. Um, for me, I found it very helpful oddly enough for mosquito bites for mm. Saul and for eczema for me that's not that's a little bit off label usage but i mean whatever i'm just my report you decide sunsetlakesebede.com left is best 20 percent off they're a great company movement partners they've donated thousands of dollars to things like um uh, food pantries and strike funds and refugee resettlement and innocence project and give directly uh, they have great business practices, $20 minimum wage, mostly employee owned, uh, company. They have great farming practices. They practice integrated pest management and uh, regenerative farming. Uh, I mean, uh, just an all around great company, great folks who run the thing. Check it out. Sunset Lake, Sebede.com. They are fans of the show and they chose their coupon code left is best for 20% off. Okay, quick break. When we come back, Ryan Grimm.
We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program. He is the Washington Bureau Chief for The Intercept and the host of the newly minted uh, Counterpoints. Yeah. Uh, I should say co-host. And that's why he's wearing a, a suit that's now right. when oh. he shows up on the show. On, on Fridays, that's right. Anytime you have me on a Friday now, you're going you're gonna to get the nice well, coat. Spiffy. Tie. It's yeah. casual, casual Friday, and uh, you show up uh, overdressed with, with, with makeup time. on. Yeah, no, you look great. Ryan's really look just great. trying to tell you who's really the boss around here. Yeah, I know. Right? I the, the boss is the one that shows up disheveled, and, like with a t-shirt. Okay, there well, there we, there we go. I win. Uh, well, all right, um, all right. So, Ryan Grimm, uh, you have this massive piece, and you've been talking about this for a while, obviously, and it was something that happened during the primaries. Let's talk about this, and then we'll, you know we can we can broaden out to the to the elections in, in general and everything that's going on. But um, a people powered insurgency threatened to reshape the Democratic Party. Then came APAC and its allied super PAC, Democratic Majority for Israel. Um, this is sort of a, in some ways, a, I mean, it's not a full sequel, but it's sort of it is a sequel uh, to your book that you wrote about you know, what took place in 2018 and what led up to it in terms of like a new crop of a younger generation of progressive uh, Democrats who were coming in with hopes of uh, taking over the party. And uh, on some level, um, and, and, and there was, we were primed to have like three or four new members maybe of the squad or uh, justice Democrats or progressive, however you want to sort of like uh, label that in the uh, run up to the 2022 uh, midterms. And then APAC showed up. Uh, yeah. W w you want to start with um, Alejandro Frost? You want to start with Nina Turner? Where does the, where does the story start? Yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're right actually that it, it works as a bookend or a sequel to the, to that, you know, the, the book was called We've Got People, which came from this AOC phrase from her ad, which was they've got money, but we've got people. And uh, we originally were actually going to headline this story, They've Got Money, uh, as a callback to that. Now, there was a big photo of an APAC conference as the lead photo, and the combination of those two things looked a little, uh, looked, a, looked like kind of looked anti Semitic. I'm like, okay, we're not, that's, that's not what we're trying to go for here. That's why so if like, you if you need a um, if you need a, a, a Jewish beard uh, to do stuff like that in the future, <laughs> I'm available. <laughs> but the point, but the point is is true that you know it was a it was people powered, voter powered, and then incomes starting in 2019. You, you know, it depends on where you want to start. You know, remember they they the first target of DMFI was actually the Jewish Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders in the presidential campaign, and setting the pattern none of the ads that they ran against him in the lead up to the Iowa caucuses were about Israel or pa Palestine they were all about how he had a heart attack and he's like too much of a socialist and they hammered him uh through Iowa through New Hampshire and Nevada and then they threw in the towel and it went after Nevada and when they threw in the towel that was that was kind of one of one of the like high water marks for Bernie they're like we we have pushed through this and now we're, you know, now we're cruising. Didn't happen. Uh, so, but that then that next cycle, they spent a couple million dollars against Jamal Bowman um, when they realized that his <clears throat> race was against Elliot Engel was was serious because El Elliot Engel, one of the most outspoken kind of Israel hawks in Congress, and also is was was the the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee. So. To have him go down to a justice Democrat candidate in in a district with a you know sizable you know, Jewish community, and then embarrassingly to them, to it, it appears to have lost the Jewish vote to Jamal Bowman, uh, you know really undercuts their argument that this is some anti you know some anti-Semitic movement. No, it's not. It it's it's not. It you know the, the it's like you know uncritical support of uh, unlimited uh, spending on. Uh, military spending, military support for Israel is not a popular issue in Democratic primaries. And so that's why they don't run. DMFI and APAC don't run on that issue. But it's yeah. not. It's also 
it's not a popular position amongst American Jewry Period. too. I right. mean, right, exactly. Uh, you that's, know, that's like, why they would vote for. That's why those precincts went Jamal Bowman. And we should say, you know, broadly speaking, I think the numbers are somewhere around 70, 75 percent of American Jewry uh, is far more far to the left of APAC on the question of Israel. In this country now, your support for Israel, to the extent that it comes from uh, the Jewish community, is maybe 25 percent, 30 percent in terms of like the way that our policy is now. Uh, without without change, <clears throat> and, and then the, the a lot district, of it comes from Christian uh, Zionists. But and the district that really shows you that was, is New York Ten. This Dan Goldman mm. versus Mondaire Jones versus Yulin New, uh, heavy uh, you know Jewish vote in that district, and APAC ended up spending three hundred fifty thousand dollars to support Dan Goldman in that district. They announced that they had done that after the election had happened. They they didn't even use their original super PAC, which was which was called what um, United Democracies Fund or something like that. Uh, they created a brand new super PAC, and what because what you can do in these primaries is if you create a new super PAC, it can start running ads, and then its first disclosure is not until after the election. Right. So APAC. Thank you, Manhattan, Anthony Kennedy. Incidentally, yeah, right. and so APAC in Manhattan had to hide the fact that it was supporting Dan Goldman. Otherwise, it would have been it would have blown back against them, even in that district. So if they can't. And so that that goes to your point that they're down two to one, three to one on on this particular question. So but that but as I point out, sorry, they don't they don't run on that issue. They they like with Nina Turner, they would they were just highlighting kind of like her, her bowl of crap comment that she had made. How how much and, and we can go through some of the specifics, but like how much of an innovation, for lack of a better word, is this where a single issue group right comes in pours money in but not to have anything to do with that issue i mean you know barely bringing it up but rather just looking for generic weaknesses that they can exploit um i mean because the dynamic usually is and, and correct me if i'm wrong if I'm a group that represents, you know, right wing uh, Israel uh, advocacy, theoretically, I want to be able to show my funders like, look at how we're promoting right wing right. Israeli advocacy in mm -hmm. this race. You could substitute anything for it, um, you know. Uh, on 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 the left, it would be you know uh, abortion rights or uh, you know expansion of Medicare or whatever, whatever it is that you're that you're associated with, how much of an innovation is it that a group will come in, spend this kind of money and really not make it about their issue, but rather uh, just go with someone as a way of either. And, and you could, as you get into this, you can outline like that, that what they're doing is they're trying to silence and shape uh, the democratic party so that there are no right. either genuine critics or or there are no you know critics who are willing to articulate a criticism of our policy uh, foreign policy relationship with israel it's it's an innovation in the sense that they've cut out some of the middlemen of the party apparatus i mean so it, when big corporate money you know gets spent in in primaries or in general elections you know it, it will it'll go to a house democratic pack or a republican you know a house pack and then that will be transformed into an ad about how this person, you know, is for defund the police, or if they're a Republican, how they're they want to throw grandma off the cliff or whatever. When it, the money is coming from, you know, cable companies or drug companies or oil companies, so they're not running oil company ads. You know, they're they but but they're like you said, they're laundering it kind of through these e either kind of a, a party super PAC or an outside super PAC, like something that Karl Rove runs or or something like that, and so. The, the the innovation here is that they're like, no, we're just going to do our own super PACs and we're going to just fund them exclusively ourselves. And then we're going to pick whatever races we want to pick. And then we're going to, and then we're going to have Mark Melman run a bunch of polling. And then we're going to just hammer whatever we, whatever we think worked in that district. And I quote this interview that Dave Weigel did with Howard core, who's the CEO of APAC who doesn't give many interviews and, and Weigel pressed him 
on this question. And he's like, well, we, we want to run ads on things that people in the district care about, which is really kind of revealing, uh, really revealing answer. Well, like, yeah, well, this is yeah. How much do you know? I mean, and I'm sure that it's uh, given our campaign finance disclosure laws, it's probably really hard to figure this out. But do you have a sense of how, what where the money is coming from when it's coming into APAC? Like, is it mm -hmm. is the innovation also that right wing groups and corporate groups see APAC as like a useful stalking horse to just weed out leftists that might say raise their taxes like they, they might be uh, agnostic uh, pardon the turn of phrase on right. the issue of Israel, but that they know that if you're going to be supportive of Palestinian rights, you also probably want Medicare for all and to raise taxes on the wealthy, for example. Right, right. It's a win. It's a win-win in that sense. And so for for this super PAC, uh, they raised uh, and spent around forty million dollars. Um, Eight point five million of it came directly from APAC, which means that it's pure dark money. You 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 can't actually. You know, find out where that came from uh, because it's coming through their various C C4s. Um, but then the rest of it actually is disclosed in, in the FEC. And so you get people like uh, Phil Singer, um, you know, hedge, you know, Republican hedge fund baron. Um, you get uh, Ber Bernie Marcus, uh, the CEO of uh, Home Depot. Actually, $2 million from that dude uh, who founded WhatsApp. And, and sold it for like twenty billion dollars or whatever. Like he gave two million dollars to APAC. You know, so some of the he, that might be just purely ideological money. Like now, I, he this is somebody who is a multi billionaire who also is you know not interested in having people running around Congress saying that every billionaire is a policy failure. Uh, but it might also just be pure ideological, you know, uh, pro is pro pro Israel pro right wing Israel money. Uh, so you can you can go through the list and it's all like it's like pro <laughs> sports team owners it's hedge fund people it's private equity executives it's real estate barons um, it's you know it's it's the it's the wealthiest people in the country and then, which you would expect when you know the bulk of the money is raised from people who are able to give checks of like a hundred thousand dollars and up like the hundred thousand dollar there there were some who were giving a little bit less than that and it looked like those might be you know, all, often around the same date. So you, there's some fundraiser where everybody's chipping in 10,000. Um, but then oftentimes you're seeing 100,000, 250, 500 million, $2 million contributions. Put into context for us the implications of this money within the context of a primary. Like, I mean, are, are we yeah. talking like how big relative to how distortive right. is this? Yeah. So as a function, and I talked to a couple of consultants about this who, who pointed out that as a function of the structural racism that has kind of created our political economy, a lot of these congressional black caucus districts, the hard money and hard dollars are what are given directly to a candidate, you know, capped at what, 28, 26, $2,800 um, per cycle. Uh, are, those, the, there's not a lot of money in those districts. You, you might have an entire race where the candidate raises 300 to $400,000. And so in, in the Donna Edwards race, for instance, uh, which is PG County in Maryland, they uh, they combined to spend more than $7 million against her, just mul multiples of of money. And so I, I interviewed uh, Logan Bayroff, who's ended up running the outside money group for J Street, uh, kind of combating DMFI. And so they watched in 2020 as DMI, DMFI spent several million dollars. And they said they expected DMFI to spend six, seven, Eight million dollars in the in the 2022 cycle. So they went around raising money. They raised about two million dollars from kind of, you know, uh, you know, super rich uh, liberals who wanted to counteract use J Street to counteract uh, the DMFI matches. So they're like, we're you know, we feel like outspent two to one or three to one. Like it's a fair fight because voters prefer our message. Right. And so we we can win this, and then boom, along comes APAC, dropping forty million. And by picking these individual races, so like in North Carolina spending. So they're outspent almost 20 to one. Right, right. And if you add in w, WFP was the biggest outside spender. Um, so they, maybe they ended up being 10 to one in the end. And so if you go race by race, the pattern that you see is that everywhere that they were outspent by like 10 to one, uh, they lose, like progressives lose. Uh, you know, six to one, they lost most of them. 
you know, when it gets down to like three to one or two to one, then progressives won most of those races. Clean, clean up and down fights, progressives won mo almost all of them. So like Summer Lee, for instance, was outspent something like two to one. And, and a two to one gap is something that a skilled politician with a base uh, can, can overcome. So basically the, the calculation is like the ratio, you can't be outspent by too much and you need a minimum amount of money. Like what that minimum is, isn't exactly clear, but you need a minimum to get your message out and then you can't be outspent too badly. That's pretty conclusive for Apex, uh, uh, for, for their uh, kind of, I guess, goals, right? They right. have a blueprint for, I mean, this is yeah, an incredibly can, that's, that's successful the test run for them. Especially yeah. when they can save money in districts and like, like, like we talked about with Kassar, with Fetterman, with, uh, with Frost. They didn't spend it all in those races and kind of got, they didn't, you know, the progressive still won, so they're not happy about that, but they did get major concessions on their stated policy of, you know, Israel, Palestine. All right. I want to get to that part in a second, but I, I, I just want to reiterate what, what, what Emma is saying is that if Ryan Grimm can figure this out with all due respect, <laughs> um, <laughs> then there's some dude in the APAC office who's like got a sheet of paper and going down the hall and saying, so guys, here's the formula five to if one. We really, if we want, really yeah. want to win, uh, we got to go from five to 10 uh, to one. That's yeah. it. And we know how much they can raise. It's pretty obvious. So here's the number. Here are the districts. Here's the number we got to hit. And what makes this, because I remember when they lost those races in 2020, there was one race that they lost and there was, we, everybody uh, brought, uh, you know, I think breathed a sigh of relief and saying like, okay, so their, um, their, their, what is it? The, their, their pilot, uh, program or their proof of concept failed. So they won't try this again. Uh -huh. And of course what they did is like, oh, okay, we're going to just spend more. We need to and, the amount we spent. and in, and now the, uh, their ability to go to these deep pocketed people, um, and say, this is it. We have the formula now. It's just a question of whether we can hit it. That makes these people go like, okay, if you can promise me a return on this investment mm. before you came to me for, you know, 500,000 and you couldn't deliver, but you're telling me if, if you give me a million guaranteed results, I'm going to give you a million. And yeah. so this is the next time they do this, their, their rate of return is going to be higher. And it seems to me, it's also going to implicate when they go, like tell the story of those three you mentioned, where they basically say, we don't have to spend this money. We just need to threaten to spend this money and we'll get what we want, at least in terms of this narrow set of policies uh, from these people, give us an example of that because yeah. I would imagine having the formula set means in the future, they're not even going to offer that as much. They're just going to go like, we're just going to get rid of you because we were able, our fundraising is up and we don't need to, we don't need to bluff in, a, in these situations because right. we now know the formula. Right. Although if they want to spend, let's say they end up raising 80 million less site next cycle and they want to outspend you know five six to one you know you start doing the math that's only 10 or 10 or so 10 or 15 races that they can play in in the whole country and there might be more than that where they want to have influence so so they do still want to have some of that chilling effect i think because especially in, if if democrats lose you know it's a decent number of seats uh and not just the seats that they lost but the seats they lost in 2020 you're going to have in 2024 a lot of open primaries where Democrats are kind of jockeying back and forth, and you and and that's on top of the people who are getting primaried. So there will probably be more races than they that they want to play, and then they can even afford, believe it or not. Like so. Um, so let me just, if I understand that last part, is that they the to the extent that they have a constraint, not just in terms of how much money they raise, but they don't they they want there to be some incumbency. The, so they want to keep Democrats at least they don't want Democrats to lose that many seats. So they can't get really mm. crazy with this because if they do, that means that they're going to have to actually participate in more races in the future. 
And is that it? I mean, is that... No. No, not not necessarily. I'm just saying that the the year itself is just likely to have more primaries. Like there weren't as many primaries these last two cycles as there were in 2018. And 2024 could end up being more like closer to 2018, where you have lots of different primaries that they have to contend with. And then the money does end up becoming a problem. Because if you have to spend $7 million to guarantee yourself to win a race, uh, and you do 10 races, that's $70 million dollars. You know, which is more than they raised this cycle. So at some point you're running up against, I mean, there aren't limits because, you know, we're talking about billionaires here. So they actually could just raise 700 million from, you know, the, the, if they just went to the same people that donated to them in 2020, they could raise $700 million. It's just a question of would they give it? Yeah, it's like, why I mean, would I... like, it's like, why guys, wouldn't you, they? You're worth like, it's, it's, like, it's like it's the interest. They're not even, they don't even have to work for that money. Like, right. they billions of dollars. Right. They just like, yeah, I'm going to dedicate the interest to this. Well, they feel a lot poorer because the market's down probably. I'm going to get uh, one less trip to Mars out right. of this or whatever <laughs> yeah. it is that they think they're doing. Okay. So, right. uh, but give an example of people that they leaned on and uh, they were sort of like the candidate preempted by saying, I'm not going to be a problem on this issue. Yeah. And so, you know, Fetterman and Frost were, I think, actually pretty similar in how it, it unfolded in Greg Kassar's and it was in Austin. And I think that was a little bit of a separate issue. Like he, and you're talking Maxwell Frost. Right. So Maxwell Frost, who ran in Orlando, uh, first, they, <laughs> they call him the first Gen Z candidate. Um, but what about that uh, Republican guy that they that they threw out? Cawthorn. Um, yeah. Like, mm. wasn't he Gen Z? I don't know. Anyway, the second Gen Z, first Gen Z Democrat, let's call him. Right. Uh, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't want to uh, sell Cawthorn short. Apparently, yet. Cawthorn's a millennial. Mm. So really, sorry. they're calling him a millennial. I guess we've got to, we've got to own him then. Yep. There you go. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so in both in both these cases, take Fetterman first. Fetterman, uh, is DMFI. You know, I actually I, I don't remember who reached out to who first, but the campaign. You know, sat down early on in, in the race, uh, in the Pennsylvania Senate race, with um, you know Fetterman campaign and DMFI sit down to talk Israel Palestine policy. Because if, as as your viewers will remember, there was Malcolm Kenyatta running on the left, who had you know who was going to get 10, 15 percent of the vote, and then you had Connor Lamb running as the centrist Democrat, who was actively publicly pleading for a super PAC to come in, and and rain down you know, death and destruction upon John Fetterman. Um, it was getting really desperate toward the end, but it was a central part. Like that was part of his strategy. Like the reason I'm going to be Fetterman is that we're going to get super PAC support. And that never ended up coming. And the, it's the significant super PAC that they were hoping would come in was DMFI. And so the Fetterman campaign sits down, they talk Israel-Palestine policy. Uh, and Mark Melman even gave an interview on this to Jewish Insider where he said that the Fetterman campaign drafted their Israel-Palestine policy paper and sent it to DMFI. DMFI made notes on it, edits, kicked the edits back to the Fetterman campaign. He said they were very receptive to the edits. Once the edits were done, Fetterman does an, uh, an interview with, uh, with Jewish Insider, which covered all of these, all of these primaries. And is that is a really great source of information for following these primaries. Uh, he does an interview where he said, you may remember this, he famously said, I'm not progressive on that issue. I'm not with the squad. He's like, and if you don't even ask me this, let me make sure you know that I tell you right now. I, I, I was appalled by that Iron Dome vote. He just just laid it all out, and and then DMF is like, you know what? We're not sorry, Connor Lamb. Like we're not we're not spending in this race. Um, in the in the Maxwell Frost race in in Orlando, DMFI in January uh, of 2022 endorsed a state senator there who uh, Randolph Bracey, he had been on an APAC sponsored trip several years earlier. He's a, you know, outspoken supporter of APAC. Like he was APAC's guy in that, in that race. Uh, from the reporting I gathered, he was very much under the impression that major super PAC spending was, was coming his way. At some point, um, his campaign reaches out to both DMFI and APAC. It's like, Hey guys, uh, you endorsed me back in January. It's getting kind of late. Where's this? Uh, where's this super PAC money? And they're like, yeah. So actually, um, it looks like that's not going to happen. Um, Maxwell Frost has had a lot of people reaching out to us. Um, uh, influential people like Richie Torres, who we could who we could talk about. Um, 
and you know he's his new his new policy on Israel Palestine is good, and so we're not actually going to spend in this race. And so Frost had gone from, and I and I kind of picked picked his story as the one to kind of be the vehicle to tell this narrative because he had gone from an active member of the Florida Palestine Network. You know his his friends and allies were, um, you know, protesting the Gaza War. He spoke at the Gaza War rally. He had signed petitions supporting. BDS, even during the campaign, he had told um, the organization he still supported BDS, very few BDS supporters in the in the House period. Um, so for for even him to be able to be kind of moved on that on that issue by the end of the campaign, such as DMFI spelt and APAC decided not to spend, just shows, you know, how much how much pressure there is because you can't and, and it's and it's fine to be uh, critical of Frost for all that. And uh, a lot of a lot of people are, but also we can't have a system that requires heroes like mm. who, are, who are going to stand up to like well, insurmountable pressure. I mean, the, the issue isn't even heroes at that point. It's martyrs. Right. right. I mean, because right. that's true because, because that's true. The, it's like we, we now just as much as they have their data to show how they can be effective. We on the, you know, the left of the Democratic Party now are clear, like, we need to figure out something else to to protect these uh, people with these positions because they're going to lose. Right. If they like and, and we're going to lose all of their stated position. Now, look, Fetterman. Once you're a senator for six years, you get into that second term. Mm -hmm things could loosen up uh, a little bit. You know, we're talking eight years out there. He becomes an incumbent much, much harder to defeat him in a primary. Right. Not the exact same dynamic with House members, but still the amount of money to dislodge an incumbent in a primary is much, much greater than it is to knock off a challenger. So, you know, we can hope that some of these people are being insincere for the short term, but... Um, this is a real problem, right? Is, is there anybody, the next piece that you're writing, is it going to be like, and here's the group that's going to fight? Uh, mm -hmm. Like, I mean, who is that group? Who could it be? Right. No, yeah, that, that's an, that's a, that's a really good point that you make. It's worth underlying. Like wouldn't, he wouldn't have been a hero. He'd have been a martyr. He, he, APAC spends $3 million in that race. And he's done. He loses, he loses like, period. Even, end of even story. With the, even with the crypto support. Yeah, that, that he's he done. He's right. done. So then because he, so now then they have right. their metric, and they and they're and they're not going to lose. Right, they're just only won by three or four points. Yeah. Right. So the, in it, so there is a group that's forming, um, or that that did form a coalition this cycle that had, you know, some some pretty impressive results in, like I said, in races where they were within, you know, two to one or three to one getting getting outspent and it, it includes generally the lead spender was working families party uh this uh, j you know j street spending two million dollars uh the congressional progressive caucus pack uh put in you know sizable buys hundred thousands you know in the hundreds of thousands in a lot of these uh key races uh indivisible picked a couple of uh, races and and went in pretty heavy in all of them kind of working in coalition and, and sunrise movement uh, also was part of this, was part of this coalition. The question, but, but it's not about kind of small dollars anymore, unless you're going to get people like, um, AOC, uh, and Bernie Sanders involved in fundraising for these, these candidates, you know, Bernie, you know, he, he quote unquote declared war on APEC, um, after, I think it was after the Nina Turner race where they spent millions and the DMFI spent millions and drove her into the ground. Uh, but declaring war for Bernie just means that like he sa says he's declaring war and then he's going to endorse candidates, but he doesn't, he doesn't put his operation. Like he, he hasn't set anything up that says, well, I have the capacity to raise $50 million. Let, let's say, he, I don't know if he does or not in a non-presidential cycle, but let's say he could raise 10, $20 million. Um, he hasn't built that apparatus to do so. He hasn't. He, Right. It, it's the thing that shuts down after the presidential campaign. Let me ask you this. Um, in terms of, let's say, AOC, who has a lot of fundraising uh, uh, powers, right? 
Um, mm-hmm. Maybe not necessarily Bernie level, but 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 up there. Maybe more. I don't I don't know. How much of an issue is it to be going into to having to play in more races in terms of these primaries um, as a member of the House? Who may be, I mean, my sense, I, ha, I have no, uh, you would have more sense of this than I would. But it, it feels to me like there is an, a, an active um, agenda of some of these progressives in, in, in Congress to start to build, see past a, a, an era when Pelosi is gone, see that there isn't going to be necessarily the same consolidation of power that there has been in the House over the past 15, 20 years an active effort to build bridges with people who don't share necessarily their politics in the house, but there's a certain amount of horse trading. You vote for me on this. Maybe I'll vote you on for that. How much does her or any progressive in the house, as opposed to Bernie Sanders, let's say playing in these races, how much does that interfere with that project? I mean, it, 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 inter- it, it certainly interferes on one level, um, but it also then builds power on, on another level. And I think that the squad in particular is never going to be in leadership. They're never going to be people that can build bridges all the way across the, the caucus. Like that's, that's done. Like that's, they, they, they are the kind of insurgent faction and no matter what they try to do, nobody, nobody believes it from them elsewhere in the caucus that, you know, particularly in 2020, uh, every there were more than 100 primary challenges to incumbent Democrats, and Justice Democrats was behind, you know, fewer than 10 of those, and I think the squad was behind basically close to zero of them. Eventually, ended up supporting some of them, uh, but incumbents thought that they were behind every single one of those hundred plus, and so they're kind of like. They're, they're not, damned now, if they do. They're, they're damned if they do. Right. They're damned if they don't. So they now, might as well do. They might as well do it. Now, Jayapal, right. okay. somebody, somebody like a Jayapal um, does have ambitions to build, you know, uh, tr- cross party relationships. And in order to do that, there's, there's, you know, you can be nice, but you can also win and build power. Right. Hakeem Jeffries has a pack. Gottheimer, you know, is out there spending all a lot of his money supporting you know, right wing Democrats. Um, it, it's it's a very it's a very normalized thing to support uh, a particular candidate in an open primary. That's the key. It has to be an open primary. Once you're playing in, in a primary against an incumbent, that culturally, you know, is something that is, you know, your persona non grata if you're trying to then run for leadership later. Uh, but if it's an open primary, totally legit. And the Progressive Caucus Pack, which has you know, raise, you know, raise and spend a decent amount of money is, is playing in those, in those races. Now they're hamstrung in a lot of ways. Like for instance, they didn't, they didn't play in the, in the Rhode Island to, you know, David Siegel right. race. And, you know, the reporting that I'd done suggested that was David Cicilline, who's the other member from Rhode Island, didn't, didn't want them weighing in on that. David Cicilline is a member of the Progressive Caucus. If you've got 90 plus incumbents who are part of, your progressive caucus, you're going to have a lot of people vetoing what races you can get in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of institutional hurdles because the institution wants to preserve its status quo. Well, uh, listen, I want to talk to you more about this. We'll, we'll have time in the coming months because this stuff is not going away. And, uh, it's a fascinating piece. It's a long read. People should read it. Uh, it's over at the intercept. We're going to link to it. We got to get to uh, Ben Dixon, but we'll, we'll pick this up, uh, at another time. Uh, really uh, depressing, but also important to understand, like, you know, how this stuff works, because um, if you're going to be involved in electoral politics, obviously not the only way and shouldn't be the only way that you do get involved in politics. Um, but if you're going to, you should understand what what the different forces yeah. acting in these situations are. And this is a really good place to start. Uh, Ryan Grimm, as always, a pleasure. You look wonderful. Really appreciate you. <laughs> I really appreciate Dolling that. yourself up for you for this. I really do. Thank you. Yeah, glad I could do it. All right. All right, folks. We're going to take, uh, uh, well, we don't even have to take a quick break, do we? No, that's okay. the beauty of the phone um, line. We're going to, uh, Ben Dixon is on the phone. He is the proprietor of the Benjamin Dixon Show. 
He's in uh, Mississippi. He is covering the case of uh, Jaheim McMillan. Um, uh, ben, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Sam. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm here with uh, Emma Viglin. Thanks so much for uh, for joining Good us. Good morning, Emma. Hey, Ben. How are you? Thank you guys for having me and helping me get the word out. Thank you so much. I know that you, um, you're you going to be doing a radio hit in about five minutes or so. So just, um, I hadn't heard about this story. Tell us what is, uh, tell us about it. Yeah, so what's going on, I came over to uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, after seeing the mother of Jaheim McMillan um, just wailing, crying on the Internet after the police in Gulfport shot her son point-blank range in front of their family dollar store, their corner store that he was known by name, so it wasn't a strange store to him. Police officers pulled into the driveway, and um, he and his friends started running because they had had a previous run-in with this specific cop. Jaheem turned to comply, put his hands up, and this is according to multiple eyewitnesses that I've spoken to myself. He put his hands up, and the police officer shot him anyway. Uh, it is so flagrant that the white supporters from Gulfport, Mississippi, one gentleman we shared a video he had on a thin blue line shirt, so he's pro-police, and he called out the shooting as point blank. He called him out as uh, the police officer as a cold-blooded murderer, and made it clear that he had his hands up and there was nothing in his hands. Uh, one last detail, Sam. He was shot in front of the family dollar store, and I came to town to try to get that footage. The footage for that day appears to have been deleted. Um, the video footage for the day before, October 5th, is available. I can see it. The video footage for October 7th is there. It's available. I can see it. But when we search for October 6th, that video footage is no longer there. Wait a second. All right. So to be clear, you're you're actually inside the dollar store in there, like uh, looking at their security cam, and it's and 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 I have um, yes. And to be sure, I have video footage of that, um, and I can share that at a later time. I'm just trying to make sure that the um, that whatever I release is approved by the family, right? Uh, by the family's attorneys, more specifically. But I have video footage, and I can. So see the dollar store you, people, uh, you would be able to see it yourself. Just to be clear, like the management of the dollar store let you come in check their video do they know why who deleted it they have not okay so i, I want to be clear i can't i can't give that particular detail simply because of the our sources uh but yes that video has been deleted and we do not know who we do not know from family dollar yet i've reached out to family dollar and they have not returned my uh my emails or my calls uh we're trying to see if it was approved by family dollar or whether or not it was uh requested by the police and it's, mm. it's even more, Sam, every family member and every organizer that is involved in this has had each of their Facebook accounts restricted. So they got the word out initially through Facebook Live and all their live streams, but none of them are able to go live now. Um, and I've confirmed and checked each of their phones. They have all been restricted from going live. We're restricted by Facebook. But this is specifically by Facebook, and it's each of the individual's. Uh, it wasn't until we got them all together to talk that they started comparing notes and realized they all had been um, restricted by Facebook. Um, have you, uh, do you know any details about the system in which these things are deleted? Because there's sometimes where I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if you delete something from a hard drive, if it is completely irrecoverable. Uh, I, I don't know. But I wonder if that's, that's the case. I'm quite sure it's recoverable simply because the digital trail goes a long way, and this is why we're leaning into Family Dollar. We need them to explain to us why some critical footage is unavailable, and if it has been provided to the police department, as it should, um, then we need to know why it was deleted from anyone else viewing. Is there any type of... who made that request. Is there body cam footage? They have stated that the... Yes, there is body cam footage. The chief of police here has stated that they uh, are not releasing that footage until the end of the year. I bet. Um, and 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 so you mentioned that one guy with the thin blue line uh, um, uh, shirt was a witness. Are there any other witnesses? And are there any witnesses who don't um, who's 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 uh, you know uh, testimony, as it were? It's not actual testimony, but but whose reports are inconsistent with that guy's uh, report. Uh, Sam, I, I I lost you for a second there. That's so you had the thin blue line uh, witness, the the guy wearing that shirt. 
who said it was uh, point blank, uh, uh, you know, no reason to do that. Is there any other witnesses and do, is their witness accounts uh, consistent with that other witness? Ben? Uh, ben. Yeah. He must have bad service. Ben, are you there? Well, we've lost Ben. I think he's got another hit to do. Um, we will, we will, um, we will uh, get back with him at one point, if not today, in the future. But uh, <clears throat> we will follow this. But it's obviously, I think you know, you can go. We'll put a link to a story. Uh, this is from a week ago. Uh, Jaheim McMillan witnesses contradict cops after Mississippi police shoot a uh, black teen in the head. Um, during a press briefing on Tuesday of must have been last week, the police chief said that McMillan was armed and did not comply with orders to drop a gun. Mm. And it sounds like, um, it sounds like witnesses say that is not the case and it sounds like uh them waiting to release the body cam footage suggests that that's not the case either i mean it would be surprising if the um <clears throat> if the body cam footage was consistent with the reports of the cops and their... well they would release it right away if that were the case uh, one would think hmm. one would think um not the most uh, fun of Fridays in terms of uh, stories back to back. I'm sorry about that, folks. But that's what's going on this week. Um, we're going to we're in a moment. We will we will we will take a lighter note and talk to uh, Ben Burgess and Jason Miles, uh, who are going to join us. We don't have both of them yet. They do are we? both. Here OK. Now. All right. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we will um, we'll. Well, I don't know. We'll play a little music maybe as a little bit of a palate cleanser and try and lighten the mood a little bit. Um, yeah, it's casual Friday after all. Uh, we'll be right back with what um, we're calling and maybe they'll adopt it. The um, Give Them a Revolution show that is taking place in L.A. Uh, this week. But, the, but Left Reckoning is excluded from... Well, the what we call them is... We reckon that we'll give them a revolution. <laughs> or we'll give, give them, them a reckonlution. A... No, sucks. That's nah. perfect. I don't know about that. That's a uh, right. revolution. I We're going to work shark. on that. Jump we'll the be, shark. We'll be right back in a moment. <laughs> hundred percent for sure based Sorry, on we're what? back ben we are we're back, back. <laughs> oh, it's like the brady bunch uh it is a casual friday folks and uh we have uh two guests that are returning to the show um ben burgess 
Jason Miles. This is this this is part of one of the greatest crossover um, live shows in the history of crossover shows. Uh, give them wow! Give them a revolution reckoning. Uh, I could do it too if I chose to wear a sleeveless <laughs> shirt that I'm just not going to show off. We, ben Burgess is we're, we're give them a um, give them a debate. Uh, give them an argument. Give them argument. argument, sorry. And Jason Miles, this is uh, Revolution. Revolution yeah. And uh, Left Reckoning will be yeah. there. And yeah. also, like, there's a little bit of TYT in there. Right, right. Yeah. And, and Nando Vila. And Nando Vila. Yeah. Um, huge show in LA. And when is this happening? On Sunday? Sunday. Ben? Sunday, Sunday. I mean, Jason? <laughs> it's, happening, it's happening on Sundays, uh, October 23rd at the Terragram Ballroom. I believe there's still some tickets available. Um, How is that possible? Anybody? It's a huge venue. It is a huge venue. Um, I was a little nervous because the venue is so huge, and they said, we want to do your show. And I was like, word? <laughs> so <laughs> there's going to be some celebrities in attendance, too, from what I hear. Uh, is that right? Oh, from the, the basketball podcasting world, there might be somebody. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Well, I'm sure there'll be other celebrities too there too. It's gonna, be all kind of, it's gonna be all kind of who's who's. I, I kind of wanted to get a red carpet for it for the uh, podcast <laughs> celebrities that were gonna be there. Yeah. We got folding chairs and Ben, stuff. where in LA is this located? <laughs> uh this is at the Terragram Ballroom. No, but uh, where is the Terragram Ballroom? <laughs> uh downtown Los Angeles. Indeed. Yes. Uh yeah, it's downtown LA. Uh and uh I don't my my LA geography sucks, but I, I do know that much. <laughs> should ask jason that question jason <laughs> tell us more about the telegram ballroom you know, no, los we're, angeles we're... is in california but jason you're in you're in mexico though right i'm in mexico I'm and, about uh, and a half hour south and uh and you will uh cross the border and uh come into uh the united states well, well, tell us about the the Terragon ball, Ballroom. I've never been there. I mean, I downtown LA when I spent most of my time in LA was just there was nothing there. Downtown LA got totally redone over the last I would say fifteen years or so. Yeah, I yeah. was downtown uh, last month. As I went and saw my son and uh, and his mom was was doing some some work downtown. So um, I got to stay down there, and him and I walked around downtown. I mean, it's still downtown L.A. that you remember. Um, there, there definitely still is uh, some shanty towns down there, but uh, the gentrification is is on another level. Yeah. So there's a lot more venues. There's a lot more, like, high-end restaurants. Like, my, my son's mom and I couldn't even really find a place to eat because we didn't even think to get reservations. Wow, because we didn't think downtown LA was like that at uh, she she, but no, no, it's it's uh, it's a it's a different it's a different LA. I know. I wish I, you should come out. Uh yeah. <laughs> that's what people. That's what you guys kept saying, but it's a little short notice. It's a well, little short notice. Gotta say, the jet set life of podcasters. I thought you guys could just get on a you know a Southwest flight like that. Oh yeah, we are jet setting. That's uh, how people describe Sam yeah, just, in particular. What? It takes a lot. Why don't, you just, why don't you just take the MR jet? It takes a lot. Oh, exactly. Right. We've I, got it out. I have um, Peacock on the line, and they'll they'll <laughs> charter a plane for us. Yeah, but. exactly. Haven't done any work for them for over a year, but if we want to use the jet, no problem. <laughs> um, blank check. The uh, it, it takes a lot to get me to go mm -hmm. to Los Angeles these days. To be totally honest, um, but um, like an online date with a conservative. <laughs> <laughs> If I was in, if, if right stuff had life, let me man. in by now, which I should say, like, I probably shouldn't say this publicly because I don't want them to, uh, to stop me, uh, from getting in, but I still am waiting for my invitation. It's been like three, three weeks. I don't think I'm getting in on the right stuff. Uh, but the jig is up and the jig is up. They must know that I'm going in there just basically to do a bit over I mean, and over you, again. You should just be able to say in your application that you were a libertarian presidential candidate. <laughs> no kidding <laughs> and also i was on that list of like uh, big conservative influences That's from true, bernie yeah. carrick yeah. but uh, no respect no respect uh, uh, in those uh, those fields um all right so uh, like, uh, like what how how do you do this with like f 45 uh, uh people on the on the bill uh there took a lot of planning 
actually no but i mean how are you going to do it in the future like what like what's going to happen are you guys going to be all on stage ben like arguing simultaneously uh yeah yeah just just and not even waiting for each other to finish sentences just like it's it's going to be like a little performance art thing it's very abstract it's not <laughs> sensory be overload yeah uh <laughs> yeah no we'll have uh anybody who ever went to any of the uh any of the the live shows that michael brooks did like has you know some idea of like uh what this uh you know what this is like so different you know groups of people will be on stage at different times to uh to talk about different things, you know, we've, um, so like, you know, if we're doing a thing where we, we talk about friend of the show, friend of all the shows, Dave Rubin, you know, like, like, like <laughs> Anna Kasparian would be on for that. You know, if we're, if we're doing, um, you know, if we're doing something where we're, you know, we're talking about foreign policy stuff then we've got, you know, then we've got our friend Daniel Bessner up there and, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What, um, I mean, this might be a good time since we've got the both of you here and obviously and Matt too is going to be there, uh, on stage, uh, with David Griscom. Give me yeah. your sense of like where we are today with, in this sort of space relative to like, I don't know, a year ago, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, I mean, it is, I mean, it's weird because I feel like five years ago, there wasn't really this space. Even mm -hmm. six years ago, it didn't exist. Um, it was just a couple, I mean, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. Nobody else. I, I, it was like TYT, this show, Pac-Man, Kalinske. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, so give me a sense from your perspective, uh, Jason, and then yours, Ben. Mm. Um, where we are in left media? Yeah. I'm curious as to, and, and also maybe not just in left media, although you know, to the extent that left media sort of reflects, uh, the, uh, broadly the, the, the left in, in this country, at least in the context of, I mean, I think it's, well, I'll leave this to you, but I, I just think it's weird how centered some people on the, le uh, on the nominal left put shows like this. I mean, you know, like, mm -hmm. I, 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 I look. I'll, I'll be honest with you, Sam. Uh, we did a we did a show, and your name came up in the show. Not even negatively. Not even. Oh, negatively. that's surprising. <laughs> okay. Why we we're friends? We're not like no. <laughs> yeah. No, no. It was, it was like it was like a rare. It was a rare case where Jason mentioned he did shit on you. <laughs> like this time he did. That guy. I didn't. I didn't Kanye you. It wasn't like it was. The, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> it wasn't. Like, and the problem with left media. Uh, gonna go, gonna go. Defcon three on the majority. Defcon three on all Jewish left. Right. Kind of, so. <laughs> but no. But I mean, uh, but like, wh where? No, but but, but your ahead. name? No. But your name came up, and what the what the conversation was about was parasocial relationships in relation to media consumption, and it wasn't a it wasn't negative, right? But that clip got more views than any other clip and the engagement there was like fights in the in the comments and it wasn't even over what the person had said it literally uh kind of made his point for him that there's so many parasocial relationships in this world i mean we're in people's homes we're in people's cars we're in people's heads for hours a day this show your show majority report is about three hours long so, you know, for three hours, people know Sam Cedar, Emma Viglin, Matt Leck, Bradley. To a degree, they feel they know you. Um, there is a very personal relationship that sometimes we as the, the people that create these shows might even deny on our end. And uh, it was kind of shocking to see the comments that were left because it was literally people arguing yelling mad at us then i got personal messages <laughs> well because because you because you because this is the this is the clip that I, I think gene actually kind of put this together as a test because yeah. because yeah. because that the or, okay if we put like sam and and i think jimmy Dore's name was in yeah. there too you know as like a you know will people you know how will people react to that of course you know they, they reacted to it by having different kinds of pavlovian reactions to the names 
in the clip, you know, the clip title <laughs> instead of actually like what said in the clip, which was like it's weird how people relate to to podcasters. Basically, was the point, and at that, that point was like very verified uh, by the uh, by the reaction to it. But yeah, I mean, it is a weird thing, right? Like that there there is, um, and like something I try to emphasize all the time on my show is like you under, like I really want people to understand that like consuming media is not politics. Right? Mm-hmm. Like that people people who's like a, a political commentator can like they can provide political education, political inspiration. These are all like useful auxiliary things, but it's ultimately commentator, you know, commenting. Yes. It's it's not like it's it's like a, it's like thinking that like and like when people talk about podcasters as if they're like leaders of political factions, that always seems strange to me, sort of on the level of like thinking that like, I don't know. Skip Bayless would be a good quarterback because he talks right. about so much. Right. <laughs> Cyber Leninism, Leninism is yeah. what we jokingly call it. Yeah, I mean, I you know, like, I don't think the parasocial stuff is particularly um, uh, strange insofar as like you know, people had this relationship with Howard Stern, right? And mm-hmm. and you know, uh, Baba Booey and uh, the Intern and this and that, all that stuff. I mean, that to me is not uh that sort of unique or uh problematic in and of itself like that because in in radio certainly lends itself to it and i think you know what we do here is more of a radio show mm-hmm. than anything else uh you know uh, aside from the, the 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 our delivery mechanism but the the the, the part that you uh point out ben about um people mistaking that which I think is like a normal parasocial thing. Like, you know, we're on for three hours. We're with people when they're doing other things, we become sort of a soundtrack for people's lives on some level. Uh, you know, people hopefully learn stuff, but like, we're not activists in doing this. We're tools of activists. Mm-hmm. We're, we're here to help activists. We're not activists. We are no more uh, on some level, like we're glorified flyers essentially. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, nobody would look at a flyer and say, like, that's an activist. No, <laughs> it's the, the activists wrote the flyers, printed them out, put them on the, uh, you know, on the on the light posts so the people so they can help with their activism. That's what our that's how I've always perceived our job. Our job is to uh, to amplify mm-hmm. specific voices, call attention. We have some editorial, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, job and like picking what, what stories we think are important for people to be aware of so that they can go out and do stuff. But there are like, it, it, the, it, there's this other sort of like attitude that has developed. It seems to me yeah. that is like, we're political players. Like when, mm-hmm. when I see people for better or for worse, either way, it doesn't matter saying like, you know, leaders of the left, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, <laughs> the best, the best we're, the best comment I ever read, and this person actually had, they stopped being a patron of This Is Revolution. They said, um, Sam Cedar single-handedly destroyed the opportunity to have Medicare for all because he was against force. I, I really wish you hadn't done that. I Frankly, because I, I reject <laughs> Medicare for all. I mean, look, uh, to be honest, uh, like, yeah, I have problems. I shouldn't have done that either. I mean, uh, <laughs> I get, the the rates on insurance have gone through the roof. We all know we are all we're just like talking well, about that. Everybody morning, makes brother. mistakes. We can't have purity tests on the left, even though Sam single handedly killed the prospects yeah, of Medicare single. for all from ever happening. I mean, no, you know, I mean because because Big Ten cause, Party. Because if Sam had said that some congresswomen should have done this like one particular parliamentary maneuver that would have been on C-SPAN for five minutes mm-hmm. two years ago then we would have Medicare for all. And I don't know why you love the private insurance industry, but I've got to say, I don't. Well, no, I, I would have been, I mean, imagine if I didn't, wasn't in favor of Medicare for all, what kind of damage I could have done. Anyone ever seen the butterfly effect? Because uh, Sam set off a chain of reactions here. It can't I mean, be yeah, undone. Was a, look, <laughs> yeah. Emma, it was let's all not bring up the, the civil war that was. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's what our our, our, fr- gonna, our friend our friend Gene right. Bajalad calls uh, calls forced to vote the Lebanese civil war for podcasters. <laughs> you know, people talking yeah. about it like, oh man, I went through some shit. There was forced to vote. I mean, I'm I do like I, I I like to think 
that the that at the end of you know my career in this space which you know will hopefully be at least well it's it's been 10 or 18 years depending on how you measure it and and hopefully it'll be uh you know significantly more that there'll be some marginal impact insofar as like like third order impact like we will have influenced or educated somebody who has gone out and done something you know or you know in their community or in politics or something like that and will be a fraction of a fraction like you know like like i have the same genes as like my great 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 grandmother you know what i mean like one of those scenarios but the idea that any of us are you know by nature of what we're doing here activists uh or have influence directly on any of this is just is just i don't know it just seems well, yeah it, it seems to me both a, a bizarre but also a function of people feeling disempowered and yes. it is in some way a cousin to the feelings that like get people to uh engage with a an alex jones or mm -hmm. some other entity that is providing sort of easier more digestible uh uh you know understanding of the world and i we've decoded it here's the truth and and now you you, you have it Th that's yeah. so shocking to me um i was at ben's debate that he had uh, kuba and i one of the guys on the show we went with or we were guests of ben burgess on his debate with tim pool and who's the project veritas guy james o'keefe james o'keefe yeah these oh, they let you into that New York show? I think well, we're no, no, no. They, they they let him into the the audience. Uh, sh should we should we say your uh, your your interaction with this event, Sam? <laughs> the oh, I'm happy to talk about it if you're comfortable uh, yeah, talking I'm, about I'm, it. I'm comfortable with it. So, uh, so I okay. So this is I was originally when I was originally pitched this. Uh, I was going to do this debate. There's going to be me, Tim Pool, James O'Keefe, and like. And this you was know, put on by like a like a Facebook like a right wing Facebook group or kinda, who is it? Kinda, yeah. So it's it's called Minds. I'm not totally clear on Minds. Like they do. Oh, some Mind, kind of, Mind, right, right, Mind, like, mind. Like minds, right, right, right. You know, right, so it's right. like I, I don't know if it's exactly a right wing Facebook or it's sort of a sort of a right wingish YouTube thing. I, I you know, alter, YouTube alternative or something like that. I'm not totally clear on the platform, but they had a uh, but. They had invited me on, and it was going to be me, Tim Pool, James O'Keefe, and basically, don't worry, there's going to be another left wing guy in there. We we still need to figure that out, basically. And then, like a couple weeks before, I remember I was out of the country, I was in Greece. They the guy texts me, and he's like, "Well, how would you feel if the fourth person was Tulsi Gabbard?" I said, "Well, I, I wouldn't feel very good about it, um, you know, because because that that seems like I'm arguing with three people now, so like that seems a little unfair." And, um, but they, they really wanted, you know, Tulsi and I could, you know, I mean, she, who it was weird. Cause she barely like, it was like, she didn't speak. She was, she was essentially like absent. Like she was like physically <laughs> present for it, but she like barely spoke. To that, that's lost. kind of her entire aura is being physically present, but like something behind the eyes is not fully there. Tulsi, it's like, you're not present anymore. Emma, <laughs> Emma she walked out, she walked out. And the and she as she sat down, she kind of turned around to sit down, you know, give the give him a little a little something. Uh -huh. And that crowd went crazy. I bet. I'm sure they that did. That crowd lost the energy their changed mind. a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Tulsi. I love you. Tulsi. Heart rates raised oh, a little like, bit. Guy, it was flare gym, okay. Sweat, sweat, sweat drop. I'm you surprised she didn't do downward floor. The air conditioner dog right there. Okay. <laughs> but the yeah. point yeah. being so, so so the point being, like uh, like I was very unhappy about that. Uh and Although I will say, I thought I was going to be arguing with her. She was really like barely there. Like she, cause, which I understand why, why? Cause like if she had said stuff that agreed with me, she would have alienated the people she's trying to court. And if she had said something, stuff that agreed with them, she would be on record about all sorts of positions. She probably doesn't want to be on record about. Uh, so I can understand why, but anyway, so leading up to, and like in the course of my pushing about this, I was like, okay, cool. At least add a fifth person. And one of the examples I used was look, I mean, Sam Cedar's in New York. This like he could just like jump on a train and you know, like he'd, he'd be there. Um, like come in my Bentley. 
<laughs> I am. Um, I'm a hundred percent sure, and I gave them a few other names too, but that was one of them. I'm a hundred. So it was. The, sure. It was two weeks out. It was. Yeah. I'm looking at the email right now, and it was. Uh, it was on on June 11th, two weeks out. You email me and those guys. Uh huh. And um, or no, you had emailed me a little bit before. No, I, I had emailed you before to be like, look, I, if I could convince them to like to like include you in this, are you down to do it? Right? And you said yes, of course. Right? So then I I was like, look. You know, and like that seemed to interest the organizers. They were like, okay, like I can get them to add another person if it's Sam. So I got back to them and and they were like, Oh yeah, sure, let's do that. Right. So everything's looking good. Uh for, for Sam being being included in this. I I remember being very relieved about this because I They email me and then and then you email all of us. Uh-huh. They email me and CC you and, and some and uh, there's a couple of these, you know big minds on the, on the email. They're, they're big fans of my work and this and that. And, um, but it turns out that they spoke with, this is the what legal they department is what they, they, uh, they spoke with their legal team and they wouldn't be able to turn around a contract in time. Now, <laughs> let me just say that like, when do you get this before in Hollywood? What, the, <laughs> <laughs> the idea that these people are drawing up unique contracts <laughs> for each person like we're not going to be able to turn this around as opposed to like like the difference between the contract that you signed to do yeah. this and yep. mine i imagine would be to change our names yep and then maybe just you know quadruple the fee Sure. And that, and, and <laughs> I'm joking. I would have done it for free. I was like, I'll pay you. Like, I'll just be there. I don't care. Like, you know, you know, give me a beer when I get there, or I'll pay for the beer. I don't give a shit. Um, and they were like, uh, we they they informed us they wouldn't be able to turn around a contract in time and update all the rest of the contracts that are already in place because you know that every time you go to one of these like group things. Mm. They list every single guest that's in there, and that's a contractual term. And I'm being facetious, of course. No, it's I, I, I didn't. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the original contract I signed uh, didn't include Tulsi's name, and uh, and I never. And got they brought her out. Of, yeah. course, <laughs> of course not. I never got of course not. Of course not. That would be absurd. It would be absurd. And like, so they go on to write this and that, and I go. I, um, I, I mean, I, my, I, I think I think I think we could be somewhere between 98 and 99 percent certain uh, that uh, that that Tim Pool specifically well said, my you know, my response was i appreciate the attempt had i found a taker i would bet my kids college funds as people know i'm very very uh willing to do that in certain circumstances that uh tim pool would have none of it um and that was basically it and uh they didn't respond for like a week or two and uh you know wanted to talk about um and i guess we did have some type of meeting I, I guess we, 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 then we yeah, were going you, to talk you about them, you and them were going to do like a zoom to like talk about doing stuff in the future. Right. Yeah. And I think I basically was like, look, whatever you're interested in doing, but I know the Tim pool will never, ever get into it. And none of these people will. Yeah. If you so, can get, if you can get them, something there. I'm like, if you, if you can get them there, I'll be there. And that was basically it. It was, um, it, and and I was a little cryptic with Tim at one point, uh, I think, on, on Twitter about this. Um, but nevertheless, you were in to do that. Let's I mean, we, we sort of got caught on a tangent. No, we, we, we got we, we got we got derailed. But I think I think yeah. Jason was going to describe the, the experience of, the, of the, uh, yeah, the, doing the, that. Cause, cause you were talking about like, you know, how people really are looking for truth tellers. And that's what I thought was interesting because I had never really other than seeing your show and you guys talk about Tim Pool. I don't know who he is. And I saw a video that he did or something musical that he did, which I thought was funny. I challenged him to a battle of the bands. He never responded. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. I would love I that. I mean, what did you minute, think man. of his, what did you think of his music, Jason? Like, uh, did you, do you like, uh, <laughs> would you roadie for that? Nickel, uh, Nickelback. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for a kid's TV show. Uh, mm. And I would never work for that. Uh, 
It was like dashboard confessional, like <laughs> 2006 kind of yeah. e emo. Not emo. Mm -hmm. Not not right. That's not right. It, it I don't was, even. It was emo esque. It was emo esque. Okay. Right? All right. I'm on the right track. Uh, it was it was an emo esque. I, I got some bad news. When you go into a lot of the smaller <laughs> places, a lot of bands sound like that still. So I've heard a lot of horrible bands in all the years that I've done. You just like Sam's heard a lot of horrible comics. Yeah, still on the I can't even go into comedy rooms anymore. Like it's it's it, you'd be he didn't. What was sad to me? It's like you actually have the ability to sit down and make some really cool, and you actually have the ability to get big time musicians in. And I was like, eh, it's kind of whack. That's why I was like, oh, you want to? You know, I will take the material that I have from four years ago and play a show and i guarantee even your fans will get blown away yeah so it was kind of lame yeah i mean tim pool uh was basically like in that debate it was basically me arguing with with james o'keefe and uh with with tim pool sort of playing and they tried to set ben up they tried james to set ben up beforehand first of mm. all the two things ben they tried to set ben up beforehand which pissed me off because i was trying to tell ben Hook me up a Tulsi Gabbard. <laughs> <laughs> like, get me backstage. Yeah, yeah no, that, me, that was, that's, me, the, that's what we, stopped we just, that from happening. This is yeah, Kim for sure. Kanye stuff we can have going on here with me and Tulsi. Yeah. Uh, right. But yeah, and, it was, yeah, it was so basically best. like the, the gist of it. I mean, I don't, I don't know how much it's worth like reciting the finer details of this, like, but it's like, you know, the gist of it is that the point that I made in a, in a video that I did about James leading up to this and uh, then that, you know, that he was uh, he was challenging me on and we ended up like really going back and forth on the debate, which is like a very simple point to me is like, look, all these guys pretend they love free speech, right? That they, they like all of these guys talk about that. But what is like, OK, you want to talk about people worried about being punished for their speech in America in 2022. What are people really worried about? Are they worried they're going to prison? No. Right. Like what they're worried about is maybe they'll get fired for their job. Mm -hmm. But if you actually cared about that, you would want to make it easier to organize unions so uh, that people would have security against, uh, against being fired that way, which is like a really basic point. And uh, and that's what the that's what the sort of bizarre attempt at like an ambush interview that O'Keefe did with me about was it was like had to do with the details. That video it was a weird thing to do because I was about to be on stage with him in this like Broadway theater in like thirty seconds, right? So it's like uh, anything you want to say, you could literally just wait thirty seconds and say on stage, but then it could be a Project Veritas video. But like whatever, like that was the sort of that was the sort of core of it, Tim was uh Tim was they were like high-fiving each other yeah uh, i don't know yeah. if you saw that ben because you hadn't come out yet when they saw they and because when you were coming out they're like yeah like we got them and it was kind of a weird vibe and uh, uh what i got and tim pool literally said that he deciphers the truth for people he says he reads an article in jacobin and he said he reads an, an article in the washington examiner not the post the examiner and then he decides what the truth is. I mean, the and CIA should use this guy. <laughs> I would also say, I would say, well, I, you can address the, uh, you know, if we believe that he reads either one of those articles, <laughs> frankly, I think what he does, maybe he reads the headlines. But, um, yeah. but beyond that, yeah, this is, that's what he offers is supposedly um, the, the, the truth. Now, you know, we all articulate stuff that in in a way that we think is, you know, that we th we're delivering an opinion that we think is the best opinion, or right. that we're you know providing information that we think is the best information. But it there's there's not they're providing answers that are uh, without nuance and th this is both on you know or there are the sure. people who do this on the right and left uh sure. frankly that are much easier to that that it don't in any way sorry that don't in any way challenge um the listener or the viewer to do any work whatsoever i mean that's basically it seems to me you know if 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 it's a one world government that is running everything or that like the problem is this company is authoritarian in some way, as opposed to some like systemic structural thing. Yeah. It's a lot easier to address and wrap your head around because you know, we're taught all the time, bad guy, good guy.
That's it. And that's the way we decipher media. I, I think I sent you the trailer for the, the upcoming uh, video essay. That's the first one I've ever done. That's feature length. And it really is about the way we consume media. Yeah. And uh, to, to it's always, especially lately, when you talk about what's going on lately, the oversimplification even happens in more mainstream news, even where when you watch something like Fox oh, yeah. or CNN, it's just a sea of pundits. Rarely do you get the old, you know, uh, Dan Rather reading the news of the day. Now yeah. It's and, more, uh, oh, go ahead, Ben. Oh, and there is, a, I mean, I should say specifically on Tim Pool, like, like in that, in that debate as in his, his efforts to, to be James O'Keefe's defense attorney, he, he said, <laughs> uh, uh, which, um, you know, whatever. I, I shouldn't say that. The, you know, O'Keefe has many, many people who are who are paid lavishly to actually do that for him. But uh, in any case, uh, in in his efforts to do that, right? So he, uh, one of the first things he said was like, because they, you know, the host had kind of given me an opportunity to say what just happened backstage, and I started out by saying what I just said about unions and free speech because that's basically the point that I came to the debate to make, and I wanted to make sure that got out there before we said anything else. And then I talked about what I said in the video and how O'Keefe went after him, the whole thing. And Tim Pool was like, "Well, man, I don't trust you as a as a journalist because you started off with this uh, this ideological statement about unions." And it's like, what the fuck did I ever claim to be a journalist? Like, I'm not a journalist. You're certainly not a journalist. Like, we're in the business of having opinions. What are you? What are you talking about? Oh yeah, it, it was the, the what was interesting about the end of the night. So Ben was pretty peeved. Um, he also didn't hook me up with Tulsi Gabbard. If you guys were wondering, he well, that's why. Me. That's why because I was mad. You know, that's he, a he blessing. Blessing in disguise. It seems you say uh, that now, Emma, but I'm hmm. trying to get a power couple here. <laughs> uh, well, you could be the uh, the future first. Um, what do they call the VP's husband? First, uh, no, no, second husband, second husband, second gentleman of the United States. You got oh, surf down there in Mexico, gentleman. Jason. What'd you say? Is there surf down there in Mexico? Mm -hmm. There you go. So, there you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Common oh, interest. All day. It would be lovely. Just blow into a conch shell and she'll show. <laughs> But but but, uh, but after the show, and Ben Burgess is like the funniest guy in the world because Ben does not exit through any superstar rock star exits. The, the MFer just walks through the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> he just walks on stage, and he walks through the crowd. And what was kind of interesting was people were going up to Ben and they were like thanking him because it was a perspective that they hadn't heard before when it came to the anti-union debate. Mm. And these are people, again, like you said, that just want to hear the quote-unquote capital T truth. And the truth merchants were kind of getting called out in real time and getting flustered by getting called out, which I thought was interesting. This is a big reason why uh, the Sam Cedars of the world can't be in the same room with these people because you're definitely going to flesh that out. That's literally what you're good at, right? So they're terrified. And, 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 and in a funny, like, I, I don't know. I think maybe it's worth dwelling for 30 seconds on just how funny it is. Don't take this wrong to be terrified of Sam Cedar, <laughs> who is is not, you know, I think a uh, innately terrifying person. Uh, um, maybe you haven't seen me since uh, this happened. There you go. <laughs> right so, here. Whoa! <laughs> Just, uh, oh. yeah, right just, uh, yeah, somebody's been doing some push-ups. So, uh, wow. just be careful, Ben. Okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, but, uh, but, like, what they're, like, what they're terrified of, uh, and uh, it's funny, I'm, I'm staying, I'm, I'm in Chicago right now before I fly to L.A., I'm, I'm staying with uh, Fred uh, Bronco Markatich from, uh, from Jacobin, and I was, I was telling him earlier today, over, actually over breakfast, I was telling him some of the Crowder stuff, that uh, happened a couple of years ago, and and it's like, but it's like what what they're terrified of is that like they're sort of like politely going to be like asked questions about like weird contradictions and the shit that they say, or that like you know, or that there's going to be like they're going to say something that's like, well, I don't think that really makes sense because what about blah blah blah, right? You know, and it's like this is something that um, I I mean, it, it's just I, I mean, it's just kind of remarkable that like this is the experience that they think has to be avoided at, at all costs. And, but they're right. I, don't know. 
I mean, I, but, the, but the point is, I think that they're, they're right on some level. And, and, and it is because, you know, we were talking about this the other day in a different context of that what they did. And there's, you know, there are some, there are some, uh, you know, on the left trying to, to sort of, or nominal left, uh, you know, more like the anti-establishmentarian, you know, uh, world on some level. Um, <clears throat> you create within the context of like YouTube, you can create what appears to be a, um, a, a, like a, a broad forum where there's a lot of different voices, but in fact, they are all within sort of a, a, a loose network. And so this person goes on, you know, Shapiro's show, and then he goes on Ruben's show, and then he goes on, uh, you know, Crowder's show, or he goes on, you know, Eric uh, Weinstein's show, or whatever it is, and whoa, everybody seems to agree. Like, there's five different voices here, and they and they agree with these different things. The, you know, what we try and do with the algorithm literally is try and get into that feed so that all of a sudden like they're like wait what a sec wait where 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 is this coming from they don't want that in person because the worst thing that could happen to them is not only is there a different voice there but you've got to address it and they don't they don't do this they don't like they simply do not live in environments where they are questioned like i realized this in talk radio when <clears throat> the way like i used to call in to talk radio a lot right wing talk radio <laughs> and you can tell by the way that uh, you know like i started because i saw how it worked on the other side and um their screeners are very specific about what they'll take mm -hmm. and on some level these people are not practiced in ever having to defend their what they say and they think they are that's the thing is that on some level they think they are and they're and they're not sure like you know i debated charlie kirk and i thought he was he was a fairly intelligent guy he had slightly different uh, i think uh, positions at that time because he was trying to sort of position himself mm -hmm you know, depending on who's, uh, you know, uh, ascendant in the, the Republican party, uh, they may reposition themselves, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't, I mean, he, he seemed perfectly capable of at least responding to what I said, but I think most of them don't ever have that experience and they avoid it like the plague and they get terrified. Like, I think they would have had a real problem if you were on stage with them and it was just like one other person. Exactly. <laughs> There's a reason why they went up there and they feel confident with like three or four people because y you're just going like this half the time. Like, wait a second. And um, it, it, getting into that, that, that sort of like closed loop, I think is um, they know how detrimental it could be to their project, which is, you know, more often than not, just sort of like, uh, you know, making money. But um yeah. I think some of them, you know, more or less believe what they're talking about. But they're also fighting an idea of you when they're doing their thing in their show in their world. It's always an idea of you. Um, it's never you're never right there in front of them. That's why, you know, Dennis Prager. Uh, I know Ben did a show recently with Anna Kasparian. Uh, and we actually have a special surprise for for Anna at the live show. I'm very excited about <laughs> about this because of her. Debate. You're going to bring, I hope it's Dennis Prager's yeah, second yeah. wife is going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis yeah. Prager is going to come out and debate Anna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, which which you noticed, by the way, that he didn't put the debate that he did on the Prager. It's, that's not on Prager U. Oh, it's not um, on Prager. Oh, I didn't it's, notice. It's that. not on Prager U. They, they, it's just like a, there's like a show they do on Prager U that did like a little couple of like clips of it. That they could mm -hmm. talk about, but but he hasn't just put the whole thing. Oh yeah, that there. debate is uh, that debate is like a, an elective. You don't get the same course credits. <laughs> you don't get the same course credits. It was, it was it was funny because I think he called for. He goes like, "Leftists don't want to debate me." No, a leftist from the New York Times. I'm like, who's a leftist at the New York Times currently in 2022? Well, also and why like, did it have to be the New York Times? Well, but also, also he was trying to have it both ways because, like, the New York Times thing gave him a little plausible out, you know. But like, yeah. he also was presented this as a general difference between the left and the right. That he says, you know, we ache 
uh, to uh, to debate them, which is like wonderful because like at the beginning of that debate, uh, the uh, the like like Anna played that clip and she and she she read off tweets from 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 me from Sam from Bosch and you know was was like look I don't think you have to ache man I, I think that like <laughs> there are a lot of there are a lot of content you know there are a lot of people here who are more than happy to to do this and which you'd think he would have prepped an answer for. Um, to be Thomas Friedman. Well, yeah. also, but 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 the other thing too is, I mean, aside from the fact that you know, yeah. the 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 so-called leftists at the New York Times are far and few between. Dennis Prager is is not like the status is uh, is not the same. Like you know, Dennis Prager says, like you know, I demand to debate somebody on the New York Times, and then they cut Wild. to like a penis uh, enlargement uh, <laughs> uh, ad, or you know, some like gold shilling. I'm sorry, like, and then I, I think we did. Uh, you know, I, I said this before in the program. Dennis Prager is us. Right. Like you know, like he can, like you know, he can, he he can go to work every day in a, in, a, in a jacket and tie if he wants. But sorry, dude, you're just an AM talk show host. Mm. And whatever led you in your life to where you are in this station, that's what you are. That's what we're doing. You're just a YouTuber with a slightly better, you know, uh, subsidy on your, your signal. But nobody's listening to AM talk radio anyways anymore. I mean, so uh, th that, that was the other part of that. It was just like, yeah, there's a reason why, you know, New York Times people aren't going to uh, debate you because... They don't even know who the fuck you are, dude. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And it's like, yeah, at that point, what does that prove? It's like, yeah, people, people are like, yeah, people to New York Times aren't going to debate, you know, Dennis Prager, which is like about as significant to say that like Dennis Prager doesn't want to debate somebody who's, uh, I, I actually, I don't even know what would be as far beneath the New York Times level as Prager U is for Prager U, but it's like, I don't know. There's like a guy who's like screaming at a street corner who like Dennis Prager won't like visit the street corner and debate. <laughs> I mean, he lets callers on his show and I called it. Well, I didn't call in. I sort of called in to his show. Sure, sure, sure. I had a caller who sort of like brought me into his phone call on his uh, program to get past them and to get he, past the screener. He, yeah. But the point is, is like he hung up. You have callers though. on your show. <laughs> You're not going to have callers that disagree with you. Like, you know, like, I mean, and, and here's the thing, here's the beautiful thing too. Um, the idea that I am going to increase my, the size of my platform because I've been on Dennis Prager's show is laughable. <laughs> First of all, 98% of his audience do not know how to operate a computer. <laughs> Without, you know, like they, they, well, they can do their Facebook uh, video conference call with their kids and stuff like that. But, the, you know, they're not coming to, to watch this show. That's not happening right. uh, with, with Prager. It's really, honestly, like there's a lot of shows where I could imagine I would get some type of bump. Not really on the right. It's really more just like screwing up. This is the thing that I, that I think they understand. I don't care that I'm not going to get a bump from being on their show. I'm there not to enhance my show, I'm there to fuck up theirs. <laughs> Honestly, I'm there to ruin their, not to develop a relationship with their audience. I'm there to ruin their relationship with their audience. That's what I'm there to do. And that's what they understand. Like, I, I'm not there to, um, I, 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 And any I'm, future audience that might come across what you do there, right? I am so. there specifically to mess up their relationship with their audience. And that is, I think, the thing that they, that, that, they, that that I think genuinely uh, makes them nervous is that I don't care about going back on their audience. I don't expect any bump from their audience. I am there to ruin their relationship, not to uh, not to get involved with with any of them. And 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 I think that's but 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 getting back to like the way that mm. sort of the people in the left perceive the role that we play, like. How big of a phenomena is that? Or is it just that we hear more about that stuff because it is from a, you know, like one thing they tell you in talk radio is like, don't get too caught up in what you hear from your callers mm -hmm. because they represent 
a, a, a tiny, tiny fraction of your audience and they are like qualitatively different right. than your audience because most people don't call into a radio show. And so there's a certain uniqueness. Now it may be a little bit different in the, in the context of podcast, but uh, that, you know, and I think there is, there's a similar dynamic, I think. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. I, I have actually, I've got to say, I don't want to sidetrack cause I'm really curious about what the, like uh, what the sort of like air America callers who were, uh, who are unrepresented of the audience were like, is it like people who are like, <laughs> you know, who are like calling in with the, uh, the like 2004 election conspiracies or yeah, like people what's the, a Bush, dude. well, it wasn't necessarily that they were unrepresentative in terms yeah. of well, that they, they, you know, that it's just that, it, it, there was no particular algorithm. It's just that the idea of like how many people call into a radio show sure, and like, what is like, how are they, you know, specifically situated? You know, I mean, I think it's like callers will, will, will confirm or edify positions you already have mm -hmm. and they will become, you know, it's like anything you're, you're always looking for confirmation on some level of, sure. of ideas that you have. I think you can, you can glean some things, but it, it, it more had to do with like, don't let calls set your agenda. Mm -hmm. I think it was really more the, the, the advice, which I think was true. I mean, and, and remember now, like we're, we're particularly in, in AM talk radio, your audience could be a million people on any given day you're doing drive time we were doing drive time in la and uh you know the slot sort of adjacent to drive time in new york chicago tech you know austin miami um we were in eight of the top 10 markets and you're talking to like 12 people from across the country maybe if you take 12 calls that day <laughs> you know it's just statistically speaking you're not necessarily getting an you know but the yeah, big it's, trick it's was like big, it's not a big randomized sample for sure. No, yeah, no, yeah, and, and I think there probably is something that's that's similar that's that's true that like I, I think probably some of what we're talking about about sort of uh, media figure on media figure drama is probably uh, unrepresentatively of concern to people who like leave comments and and all of that stuff. Like that's that's probably that, I mean that's got to be true. Right. Like, like I, yeah. I, 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 we all go out into the world, right? We're going to go out into the world on, on Sunday and talk to people. Yeah. I mean, Ben and I, Ben actually came down. Ben's a good friend and actually came to visit me. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so. laughs> uh, listen, I, I, I soon, soon, soon. I'll definitely be there. I mean, Mexico hey, ben, tell sounds how, great. Tell them, how, tell them how pretty it is on the day. No, it is, it is, it is beautiful. It is Wait, nice are you guys in the same spot right now? No, no, no. I, uh, not right now. Not, but not right now, but, but a <laughs> couple months ago, I was, I was yeah. in. Uh, we actually did oh, okay. a, uh, we did a, uh, we recorded an episode on the on, on the Jason's terrace. terrace while I was in, in Mexico. He said it was the first in a series of episodes that he was going to do where he uh, he he uh, he kidnapped white people and like recorded podcasts <laughs> with them on his front porch. But um, but yeah, it's uh, no, it is it is very uh, it is very beautiful down there. But yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's certainly true that like nobody ever, like I've had, I mean, you know, we were talking about um, like, I've never had somebody who came up to me like, um, you know, that I'm like out at, out at, like out at a bar or somebody and like, you know, something and, and, you know, I mean, not that this is like a super regular occurrence or whatever, but like, yeah, sure. Sometimes somebody might be like, yeah, you know, I, I, watched this or that or i liked it or whatever like nobody's ever there to like challenge me about like fucking force the, sorry uh, about force the vote or whatever you know like nobody's you know that's not what's happening right so it's like yeah i i agree i think that stuff is unrepresentative and i think that's which is good because i mean this this kind of goes back to where we started the whole thing about like what what sort of role this can play and and can't play that like i think it can one thing it could, one role it could play, and like all the stuff with the debates and all that, like is relevant to this, is I do think, not in a huge way, I don't want to overstate it, but I think it can like peel off some people from like falling into bad views, or some people right. who even had bad views can, you know, can come off of it. I mean, anybody who does that stuff regularly will have people tell them that, like, you know, I used to be a libertarian, whatever, you know, now I'm not anymore, and, you know, that's. 
I like that, you know, but like that's one role. And then another one is that it can provide some sure entertainment for sure, edification, intellectual clarification, and also just like a sense of community to yep. to people who, you know, who might not feel it otherwise when they when they're sort of engaged with with this kind of stuff, which I think is you know, because given that you do have to, like, if you want to actually engage in political activity that will change the world in some way, like, at some point you have to, like, log off and, like, you know, um, do, stuff. do stuff, right? You have Touch to talk. political grass. Yeah, hmm. you, have to, you have to knock on doors. You have to, like, talk to your coworkers about you did or whatever, like, whatever it is, right? Like, you have to do stuff out of the world and, and there your, you know, your YouTube friends, you know, can't directly help you, you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, but what it can do, right. And both, and this is in terms of both relationship with like the show and also with other people who, who consume it, that is actually valuable is, is, is provide a sense of community that can like actually help sustain you while you do that stuff, which is actually huge. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. So it is a uh, Sunday night. October 23rd, three days from now, not even two days from now, two days, yeah. uh, in Los Angeles, w- the, the venue again, the Terragram ballroom, in the Terragram ballroom, beautiful, uh, downtown Los Angeles. Where do uh, I get hopefully. tickets? If I, if, if at the last minute I decide to tell my children, here is some food. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the refrigerator. <laughs> Just go to it guys. Have whatever you want. Yes. Please don't tell your mother I did this. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I and I shoot out to LA and then take the red eye back. So I'm here on the Monday. Where do, what website do I go to to get uh, ticket information? Oh yeah, all right. magic. Yeah, so it's 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 Ticketmaster. If you go to, I'm pretty sure any of our Twitter accounts right now. Just go to Terra Terra uh, Graham. T E R A Gram G R A M Ballroom dot com and just click on the uh, give them a revolution for uh, October twenty third and you put, press tickets and then that'll take you somewhere to buy them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Pretty sure all of our pin tweets have have links to that, or you can a nice trailer for it as well. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. It's true. We do have a nice yeah, trailer, for, trailer it. Uh, for it. We, we still want to come to it for putting that together. We still want to come well, to New York in do, November. Do you think November is possible? Or you is don't need my order? permission. Yeah, we do. We were like, let's let's hook up with Sam and Emma, and let's go do a New York thing. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. I mean, probably after the election, right? Yeah, we want to have an election party. Yeah, wow. Well, that was the original idea, but are we going to be able to, like, I, I wasn't no. clear on where we were at with, like, You're a not going to be I able think, to get a venue. I, I, think, gonna I, be think, able, I think we're going to have to. I think it's going to do it outside. Yeah. Oh, was it snowing in November? probably and it won't be pleasant (laughs) well guys we'll we'll, we'll do we'll do uh we will do a show in new york indoors it won't be it won't be on election (laughs) night but uh it will it will happen before long uh we we will make we will make sam abandon his children and come to it it'll be a good time fantastic (laughs) all right guys thanks so much for uh for coming on good luck sunday night and um we'll we'll send uh Matt out there with our best wishes. He'll be, we're gonna, we're More we're giving him a makeover right. and we're putting him in. Oh yeah, nice Jason's job. got the left reckoning tank on. I oh nice, that. yeah. Well, Sweet. I gotta nab one of those. All right, guys, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thanks, we'll sir. put a link uh, to the uh, to the ticket sales at. Uh, I guess it's a freebie Friday. I don't know how we would. God, unbelievable. More freebies than that. Yeah, this, this is like um, February should be the freebie Friday month, but instead it was like Frocktober, <laughs> Freetober. February because it starts, starts with, with the word F. free. Oh, okay. <laughs> February. Freetober. Free, yeah. Free, February. Mm. Mm. I don't know if I like it. Um, I don't think we can take any calls uh, today, folks, but we will take calls on Monday. Yes. We will be back here on Monday. We've got a great show planned for you. We are only uh, three weeks out to the um, oop. the election. January 6th committee subpoenas Trump. Hmm. But they did yeah, that already, good luck. right? 
I don't, I don't, I think they were talking about it, but now they've done it. Officially. Like they formally issued it. So they seems. voted unanimously yeah. like a week ago yeah. and now they just did it. Yeah. Okay. Because remember, if you'll remember from yesterday, we were talking about uh, that. They were having trouble finding an attorney who would accept, accept it. The yeah. Subpoena. Oh, okay. And now it seems as if they've found one. Um, let's read some IMs. There's a great new leftist publication, Common Insider. There's nothing like Common Insider in the morning, says Nell Gringler. I don't know what that means. Gross. Wait, what is? Oh, oh. it was on. it was Caribbean. That's doc. not even a funny one. Solidarity with VPG Union, Santa Clara Doctors Union in San Jose, California, announced their strike this week after 93 percent of the members voted to strike last week. They have worked through the pandemic without a contract for the past two years. If they strike, it'll be the largest strike of doctors in recent history with over 400 doctors participating. We should look into that for a Wednesday show. A Dwuber. The only other majority report listener I ever met in the world was volunteering as a canvasser for Beto in 2018. Your audience is mostly people who do stuff. You have unionizers. Would love more interviews with folks in all sorts of volunteer positions to get a sense uh, for what to do and what's important. That's a good idea. I mean, we, you know, we've been doing that a lot with over the past couple of months with union uh, organizers and, 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 you know, these are just like regular folks like you who work at a place that is not unionized um, or maybe it is and they start to organize more. And, but, you know, we've talked to a lot of people who just decided one day, like, this is BS what's going on. And um, we need to start a union. Yeah, I um one of my friends from um high school used to work at Kickstarter and he knew uh Danelle Gerardo who came on our show uh who was who was a integral to the Kickstarter union effort. So like they're just, you know, some of the people we've had are really just, you know, workers who wanted to like you said get involved and organize and 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 do it in a difficult place sometimes when it comes to digital organizing or tech mm. organizing. So right. Yeah, and it's easy for us to forget it sometimes, but uh, that is true when uh, whenever people make the critique of like, you know, this is just training people to sit on their ass. Like that's a worry, but uh like I know of experience like my buddy Chris both running in the Democratic Party and also uh working in the uh, teachers union stuff meets a lot of majority report uh listeners in Texas. Yeah, I I I mean oh. Uh, certainly that's the goal that that's the agenda here i mean i i i would much rather have a smaller audience that is doing stuff that takes what we get, you know we do on this program and in some part what we do on this program inspires educates uh motivates provides some type of resource or help or you know aid like i say we are People are going to clip this. I just saw from my end, but we are tools that should be used by activists. Um, yeah, I view it. We're as, not activists. Yeah, I view or at it, least in this context, we're not activists. Like we're defensive for the activists and the people who are actively agents. I think. Like, and I think you can occasionally on margins. Like media can be a politi political for you know its own ends, but I think mainly it's like to make sure that. Like when unions go on, um, the narratives of the bosses are countered and things like that. Yes. Um, and then occasionally we're here to entertain, just like Dave Rubin, ah. who is really, really funny. And how do you know? He's hitting a stride as a comedian. Um, things are really clicking on all cylinders. Um, here is AOC at uh, a, um, I guess this is a, uh, town hall. She's having a town hall, and she's doing a little bit of like a classic New York voice, mm. you know, like "forget about it," you know, which, um, you know, some people may find charming, or some people may find nefarious. But here's Dave Rubin, who um, he chose to open his show with this. He opens his show with it. The cold open, the direct message. Yeah, from Dave. Uh, Here it I is. mean, the audience needs to see it. The audience needs to see it like, well, baby. Okay, here we go. It, yeah, he should play my Fonzie impression next. To, to, just to, before, Tim Pool said, AOC has betrayed her constituents when she tweeted out this video. So just imagine what you think AOC might do and how yeah. they might be. Yeah, she's yeah. betraying her constituents. Here we go. Oh boy, oh God. All right, pause it for a second. So apparently the more LaRoucheites came out and were, were protesting and she did 
like a New York, and it almost sounds like on some level she's doing an imitation of like her grandmother or somebody. Yeah. Like there's a little bit of like you can hear a little bit of like New York Puerto Rican uh, uh, character in there, um, which of course is a massive betrayal of those people who voted Slap for her, in the face. <laughs> who specifically said don't do any imitations of like maybe your grandmother or your aunt as a congressperson that would be uh beyond the pale that turned her district red right there yeah. it's go. just they all left the democratic party i'm just remembering the uh, tea party protests against obamacare and i'll just say if democrats were like mocking those protesters i think we'd be in a better position today than being afraid of them well i got news for you i was but yes go ahead <laughs> Okay, okay, it's the Ruben report. I'm Dave Ruben. Ah. Hello. <laughs> How are you? It's October 20th, 2022. I am Dave Ruben. This is the Ruben Oh, God, wait a second. You got to pause, buddy, because I'm still laughing. I'm still laughing. My eyes were closed. And that, wasn't that just AOC talking right there? He, 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 he thought it was surprised. so funny, too. It was, that was good stuff. That was good stuff. But wait a second. It'll explain why it's funny. I'm right up right listed, okay, okay, it's the Ruben Report, I'm Dave Ruben, ah, hello, <laughs> how are you, it's October 20th, no 2022, joke, I am Dave Rubin, this is the Ruben Report, we are live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and Blaze TV, subscribe if you have not, and uh, that cold open there, that is AOC <laughs> giving a little talk in her home district, and uh, the protesters continue to show up. They don't like her very much. They think she's one of the key pieces leading us to this bizarro war in Ukraine. They've had it with cutting off kids' genitals. They don't like her general disposition. Mm. Pause it and, for a uh, Okay, so let's just be clear here. The mm. bizarro uh, war in Ukraine that we started by having Russia invade them. That's the bizarro part is it wasn't us that did the invasion. <laughs> it's pretty bizarro. And then cutting off kids' genitals. Oh, he's leaning into that. Oh, yeah. He's full. full Got to get on that transphobia train because he's running so hard from his audience, having found out that uh, he and his husband had children with uh, surrogate moms. Uh, but continue. Here we go. He's. Given the situation. Okay. She gave him exactly what they were. Hey, there. You came. You there. Her reign of terror is almost over. No I'm joke. telling you, she's got a chance to lose this election. She really does. We can get rid of these people. And what do I always tell you guys? The post woke world to get in it. It's not. We have to just map Pause what it, it would for look one like. second. Uh, we should also say that, and and I would encourage somebody to do this because we're not going to do it. If you compile every prediction, electoral prediction that Dave Rubin has made over the past like six years, you will find that. Um, he was convinced something was happening out there and people are leaving the Democratic Party in droves. This was in the run up to the 2018 election, which had record turnout in the century for Democrats in an off year election. Um, it is possible that AOC could lose her election mm. in the sense that she's participating in an election. And it's within the realm of possibilities, potentially the likelihood of Republican voters um, voting against her because of these LaRouche protesters, I would say is pretty small. Yeah. But um, the, her reign of terror <laughs> is almost over. Um, and of course, um, but he, listen to what he wants to go back to. Yeah, this is like the, his political utopia. Yeah. There, you came, you there. Her reign of terror is almost over. I'm telling you, she's got a chance to lose this election. She really does. We can get rid of these people. And what do I always tell you guys? The post woke world to get it. It's not. We have to just map what it would look like to really be beyond all of these people and just say, turn the clock back 10 years ago and all feel good about America again and have some liberals, have some conservatives battle it out. But we're all like, OK, America's good. Let's roll Pause it. And then oh. we 12, 10 years ago was 2012. 
This was when there was an adamant insistence that the president of the United States was born in Kenya, was not an American, was a secret Muslim. Um, Mitt Romney's car elevator was at the top of the, the news cycle. He was um, saying that half the country is taking from, uh, right. from society. Right. Republicans had retaken the House, at least, because uh, uh reaction against Obamacare. Mm, right. right. Um, the uh, Mitt Romney not only said that half the country were takers, not makers, he also said that he'd be president uh, by now if, when his uh, grandfather lived in uh, uh, Mexico, his last name was Ramirez instead of Romney, which, of course, I think was a slight misunderstanding of, of the trajectory of, uh, a, a, you know, that his uh, life took because his father was named Romney. Uh, also, Dave Rubin would have found that um, he was not allowed to have the right to marry his husband, never mind have children together. Um, but that's the place he wants to return to. Let's get back. Let's is he say more about like a uh, like a post woke world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'd be looking in the rear view mirror going AOC you later. We don't want anything to do with you people. So today oh, wait, go back a little bit here because this and I don't you don't have to cut to me just stay. For some reason he goes into his Bill Cosby impersonation here with the the put the pudding in the, the and I'm not sure why he did that. Dip do the dance against the constituents and <laughs> betray your body. <laughs> have some conservatives battle it out but we're all like okay america's good let's roll and then we'd be looking in the rear view mirror going aoc you later we don't so want anything to that. do with you people so you today, people. we're going to talk you about put uh, put that wide tent conservatism or libertarianism oh. uh the sort of stuff that i've been kind of pushing around here and we're also going to talk about the the last ditch effort by the Dems to hang on to power because all of the polls, every bit of sort of cultural norm right now is sort of trending towards the conservatives, the Republicans winning. Every Again, sort you know, of my like feelings on the word conservative, norm. I'm using it in a broad sense. Uh, but there's a lot of good momentum right now. We are going to dive into it using videotape. And before we get to any of that, what? Uh, what are we talking about? Wow. Add time now. That's just like cultural a norm. All right. So let's go to what, the, what he visions. How Governor Ron DeSantis is going to take us this country into a new place where, remember, this is the guy who just sent cops to arrest people who were confused about their ability to vote, who had been informed by state workers that they could vote. They voted. Two years later, DeSantis sends out cops to arrest them. One of them, the first of the 20 that were arrested, has already been now uh, the their, the judge just threw the case out saying this is ridiculous. Understand why DeSantis did this. It wasn't to arrest those twenty people. It was send, send a message yep. to uh, black and brown people that you could get arrested. I mean, it's, don't even try again using people's lives as propaganda objects, just like the migrants. With just like the migrants, but here is Dave. Hopefully, we can return to this new place where Ron DeSantis will shower us, shower us with his, his benevolence. And Biden and all of this was just a distant memory. And we just had a sane functioning president, say a Ron DeSantis and a government that was scaled back a little bit. And if you wanted to smoke weed, you could. And if you didn't want it, you didn't have to. And if you wanted to marry a dude and you happened to be a dude, you could, and you weren't gonna force other people to marry dudes. It can all work. It's what we had. It's what we had. It's what the promise of America is. I think was it? Wait, like, it. when did, what, like, what, is he looking when back? When was weed to... legal? He just said you could smoke weed if you wanted. You could, didn't have to smoke it if you didn't want. Is, are people compelling everyone to smoke weed? Because at this current juncture, it's still well, not legal the, on the federal level. If you read the New, New York Lab about next year, February, there's going to be a compulsory uh, uh, smoking element where you have to smoke in order to like get I'm in in public transportation or anything like that. And also you have to have gay sex. Um, it, it doesn't say you have to have sex. It says you have to marry a guy. Oh, okay. That's Very the sorry. only reason that he did it. <laughs> that was in the 
way, of the, the only reason this is how Dave can have an out with his audience. The only reason that he's married to a man is because he was compelled to by law. I'm I think still the left has tricked me. Too yeah. much yeah. first. <laughs> I too got much this first flyer gay in the marriage. mail, and it said I had to marry my husband. Too and much I first the law. gay marriage. You wanted to marry a dude. You didn't have to marry a dude. There you go. There's Dave Rubin for the day, ladies and gentlemen. You're welcome. He doesn't have uh, really a, a very coherent train of thought. Doesn't matter, though. It really doesn't matter. Just feels right. Just success. Yep. Very, very successful. Um, what should we... Uh, what sh oh, let's do this. This is an interesting... Because this... It, it, this um, There was a there's a debate in Oklahoma. Uh, there there's a chance for a Democrat to win uh, the governorship mm. in Oklahoma. We mentioned this the other day. It's, I mean, it, it it's really sort of surprising. Which speaking of bad predictions, I believe uh, this Republican Kevin Stitt was on Dave Rubin's show um, uh, this summer. So if he loses, I'll be going back to that interview for uh, clips. And yeah. I mean, this is the state that has the nation's str uh, strictest abortion ban right now. So I I mean. Or at least one of them, and it was one of the first to to sign it. That's what uh, made a priority. So I'd imagine that this is going to be one of those test gr testing grounds for abortion activating certain kinds of votes. And it's kind of an interesting race because the Democratic opponent, Joy Hoffmeister, is a former Republican, and due to her disagreements with Stitt, she um, she t switched parties to run against him. And um, Stitt himself might have some more unique vulnerabilities because he's also on the on the outs with a lot of the um, tribal nations in Oklahoma, which are a huge, you know, kind of demographic there as well, who, you know, have also kind of had some conservative voting patterns. So it's kind of an interesting race that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be kind of close, but it could be it could be close. So here's um, and this is what's interesting. Do, and, and, and do you have that tweet that I sent you, uh, though, or that graph? Right. OK. So we know that the narrative and one of the things that that has been um, the Republicans have been running on is the supposed this increase in crime that has taken place in the country. And crime is up relative to where it was pre pandemic. It is down significantly relative to where it was, let's say, 15, 10, 20 years ago however metric you want to use so really any time over the past 30 years i think more um again i subscribe to the notion that the diminishment of 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 leaded gasoline sort of led to uh some of this um but here's something that also sort of like really uh sort of short circuits the narrative and there's been a couple of studies that have come out some you don't really need studies. You can just look at sheer numbers. It's not, uh, but you don't, uh, that, that make a more general point. But here is um, Joy Hofsmeister uh, uh, responding to uh, Kevin Stitt. And, and watch this. This is an interesting uh, fact. Let me say this real quick. We're talking about Lawrence Anderson, who was redocketed in error by the Pardon and Parole Board. This matter That's was right. investigated by the Oklahoma County Grand Jury they allege that there was improper influence. I don't know about that matter. What is your understanding of why Lawrence Anderson got redocketed and then got commuted? You know, th there's thousands and thousands of people in, w that, are, that are currently in prison and they're gonna be getting out this year uh, that have got certain sentences. And the Pardon and Parole Board goes through those the best they can. There's five people on that board and they recommend for some people to get released. And sometimes bad things happen. And with thousands of people every year, the other thing is just throwing away the key and locking every single person up for good. That's not the solution either, uh, Superintendent. And so things are gonna happen. And for you to take that type of shot and bring those wounds back up and try to make those families out there think that that was somehow uh, I was responsible or the five people on the pardon and parole board, uh, they absolutely would change their vote and make a different decision if we knew that that person was gonna kill someone. Everybody out there knows that. We all know that you're just trying to make political points. That's disgusting. Pause it. Now, I should say, um, in terms of the substance, I, I agree. I, you know, well, obviously people who get paroled, uh, some minuscule percentage of them, um, could go on to commit a heinous crime. Um, but 
she learned this from the Republicans. <laughs> and it's kind of fascinating that he said, Stitt says this, because this was kind of similar in the Kentucky governor's race where Andy Bashir, the Democratic governor, now hit Matt Bevin, the Republican, for sentence commutation. So it's kind of interesting that two Democrats in red states are kind of going a little to the right of the Republicans. Yeah. On I mean, I don't, as a broad message, uh, I don't like it very much. Right. Um but at least they're talking about crime. I mean, in this specific instance, like I feel like Democrats have largely abandoned that topic and that's where Republicans have made gains nationally. Uh, but this is uh, the, the interesting fact is coming up here. So, Real quick, let's let's keep the pause down. Thank so you. So let's talk about the facts. The fact is the rates of violent crime are higher in Oklahoma under true. your watch than it's in New true. York and California. That's a fact. Well, we'll have that oh fact checked gosh. by the Frontier <laughs> Superintendent. It's also a fact that medical Hang on, marijuana... Hang Oklahomans, do you believe we have higher crime than New York or California? That's what she just said. Safety and security... Hmm. Um, hey, Oklahomans, we're going to put up a graph that will show you the per capita, obviously... Um, Oklahoma does not have uh, the population. You will notice that um, age-adjusted death rates, homicide mortality by state, uh, the states that are, have the lighter colors are um, smaller, uh, have a smaller uh, mortality rate by homicide than in the darker colors. And you will notice that uh, New York... California are sort of like a, I don't know what you would call that green, sort of like a frosty green, hmm. sort of like a, it's like a green. Winter green. It, no, it's not quite that dark. A lighter green. It's a lighter green. It's like a, like a, like a frosted green. It's almost like a, a color that you'd associate with like the green of the 1930s. I, I associate that color with. Now, of course, if you look at, um, uh, can we zoom in on that? Oklahoma. Not quite dark blue like those other southern states. Which also, by the way, correspond with, I think, the highest poverty rates in the country. Might, might oh, those be. don't correspond with the, uh, the states that defunded the police? No. That's odd. Weird. weird. Odd. It's not a lib per capita. <laughs> uh, Oklahoma, uh, significantly darker, let's say, than uh, New York or California. Um, it's and a it is a way to reframe the conversation about crime. It, I mean. Yes. And this is coming on the uh, heels or in the wake of, of a couple of studies. One came from Center for American Progress, conducted by a team of seven academic researchers. researchers. Study compares cities that have elected so-called progressive prosecutors with places whose district attorneys continue to pursue more traditional approaches. Uh, the study found that homicides over re recent years has increased, because it's increased in all these places, less, at a lesser rate in cities with progressive prosecutors than in those with more traditional district attorneys. Also found no meaningful difference between cities with progressive or traditional DAs in the trends for larceny and robbery. Another study by the Third Way a group, these are basically like non-Trump Republicans, found that per capita murder rates in 2020 were 40% higher in states that voted for Donald Trump than those that voted for Joe Biden. The study found that eight of the 10 states with the highest per capita murder rates in 2020 have voted Republican in every presidential election this century. Just an important uh, data point. Uh, for you to keep in mind when you hear all this uh, BS that's floating around. And, like, why is this happening? Uh, James Sirowiecki pointed out, because um, the Washington Post opinion had a Mark Thiessen article, High Murder Rates Driven by Lethal Violence in Democratic-Run Cities. And Sirowiecki points out, you'd exclude every murder committed in St. Louis and Kansas City, and Missouri would still have higher murder rate than uh, states like New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And it's because, like, you, like the, thing, the lead thing, like, there's lots of reasons why crime is higher in America, and it is true. Like, there is more crime than there should be in this country. Uh, the solution to that isn't more cops, because we have more cops, and we um, cage more people than any other countries, too. The problem is there's an underinvestment in people. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that is what, that, that's what's being masked now when you act like it. And that's why it bugs, like, 
I, I don't think Democrats are speaking well to this at all because that that's where it has to be. It can't be like Val Deming saying I'm the real cop. It has to be like right. this we, was an improvement. I mean, in the yeah, sense yeah. that like at least over throwing that narrative. Well, the point is just the only time you hear Democrats for the most part talk about the crime is when they're kicking the left to say that the we, I don't support defund the police as opposed to reframing the argument and saying like well republicans are lying to you about this look at these statistics yeah like in both the tim ryan jd vance debate, the first one and then the mark kelly blake masters uh, debate the entire uh, framing from both kelly and ryan was i've 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 supported bills to to hire more cops i've supported bills to hire more border patrol officers there's nothing about like oh like what are the actual what are actual things to be done besides hiring people to to like enforce the law but that would actually it, mitigate any sort of crime. And even if you don't want to go there, that's fine. But just don't either kick the left and say which they're going to uh, the Republicans are going to use their framing about defund against you anyway, because you're the members of the same party. So just for self-preservation, don't do that. Or they're being quiet and not saying anything at all. This third way is better than those first two options, yeah, I think. Because to your point in the Demings Rubio debate, I mean, Marco Rubio was talking about Val Demings, a former police chief who was in the running to be Biden's uh, vice president in 2020 as one of the most progressive or left leaning mm. members of Congress. That's just by just by virtue of of any metric you can imagine is a blatant lie. So why not even the the framing of that is not going to change regardless of whether Val Demings shows her badge or not. No. Um I want to shift a little bit to uh, to uh, inflation. This is really uh, uh, a couple of days ago. Neil Kash uh, Kashkari, who was the president uh, of the CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, uh, sort of like I think gave a little bit away of the game of what the Fed is doing. I mean, he's generally like a, a so-called dove when it comes to inflation. Now he's become a little bit hawkish. So much of this is really about like our government refusing to take steps that could deal with inflation. I even think like the Biden administration has some, has some arrows in its quiver to deal with inflation, but they don't want to because of the nature of our system in this country, they don't want to hurt and corporations and, and, and wealthy people really control the way that the government reacts to these things. Here is Katie Porter um, arguing about what is contributing to, uh, to inflation with a friend of show, I feel comfortable saying, Mike Conzel. Um, who is uh, who is testifying? According to this chart, what is the biggest driver of inflation during the pandemic? The blue is the the dark blue is the recent period. It would be corporate profits. And what is that percentage? It is fifty four percent, and that number does stay that level of high if you update that number to more recent numbers as well. So over half of the increased prices people are paying are coming from increases in corporate profits. Yes, the unit price index is reflected in corporate profits as opposed to other costs. And how does that compare to historically, to other periods of inflation or uh, over other periods of economic time? As reflected there and in other analysis, it is significantly higher in this recovery, 11.5%. And what is it today? 53%. Uh, so I wanna make sure everyone in America understands this chart. What is a unit labor cost? The cost, wages, and an associated right. work cost. So we could just wages. What is a non-labor input cost? Uh, a variety of things, including um, maintenance and, in, and investments. Okay, so I I have to buy the buy the stuff to make the widget. I have to have a factory. I have to keep the lights on. I have to hire someone to make the widget. That's this stuff. And this is what I add on, on top. Um, hold up that that chart and and you will see uh, unit labor costs incredibly low relative to where uh, they has been in uh, on average relatively speaking in terms of what is contributing to the prices 
corporate profits, the biggest element of this. Not you, wage growth? <laughs> Kashkari, even in this, uh, this Bloomberg piece, the inflation didn't come from the labor market. This inflation came from supply chains and energy com- and commodities. He won't say corporate profits. Do we actually have a tight labor market? One way I would define tight labor market is labor is in a relatively strong position and their share of the pie is growing. Their share of the pie is shrinking. So I don't know. They don't want to point out what Katie Porter is pointing out here. We are looking at two different things that are happening. One is we have a massive disruption in our supply chain that is still rippling through the system. And two is corporations are taking this opportunity to price gouge. Mm -hmm. This is, it's, you, you can imagine being in a town or a city that has just been hit by a hurricane. Cost of everything is going to go up because maybe the bridge is out. They can't get, uh, they have to drive around the other way. Smaller trucks have to come. Uh, there's not as much uh, stuff at the, at the store. Maybe one of the stores, uh, the electricity broke and the refrigerators spoiled all the food and whatnot. And then on top of that, imagine that one of these shopkeepers is like, this is a good opportunity for me. I've got a lot of water in the basement, to be honest with you, but this is a good opportunity for me to charge four times what I normally charge for a bottle of water. <laughs> That's what's going on here. Yeah. That's what's going on. So what is the what is the, the, the tool that the Fed could use, in theory, to discipline corporate America? Because all you hear Powell talking about is softening labor market conditions. And he has a, like he's been raising interest rates uh, and that still hasn't made enough of a dent because the corporations are still gouging. And the way that they're doing this, because the Fed has limited tools. The way that the Fed is doing this is we are going to hurt workers enough that their consumer ability is so low that it convinces corporations that they can't now price gouge anymore that's it's basically like saying we're going to use a uh the workers not so much as a hammer but as like a like almost like a a, a tool to pry the corporate uh grip around these prices uh, uh, uh loose the 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 way that the only other way that our government could address this and there's only so much that that can be done, period. Taxation? <laughs> no. Uh, and, uh, well, we can't do that. Not, well, you could tax corporate profits. That would be helpful because if they're not going to see these profits, then, and, and they're going to suffer in terms of volume sales, but they're not going to see the profits that are associated with it, right? Because this is, and there was a story about this actually in, in ProPublica about what's happening in the housing market. There is a uh, software that's being used by something like now half or three quarters mm. of the management companies in this country with big ownership where they are basically, they're using an algorithm that basically says like, you can leave apartments vacant. In fact, in this city, apparently like 10% of the rent control apartments are vacant right now. And this algorithm will show you that you can drive up rents, increase in rents, even though you're keeping apartments vacant. Mm. Uh, part of it is you are creating a scarcity of the product there. It's basically price gouging. I mean, it's like you, you used to, in order to price fix, have to have like a nice dinner or lunch or something with all the other capitalists in your community. But now you just subscribe to an algorithm. Exactly. In fact, uh, someone in that piece, someone in that piece said, um, the, the best way to think of this is instead of thinking of the software, uh, say a guy named Bob. And a guy named Bob told us to raise prices. Bob will tell you, yeah. And Bob said to raise it three point, you know, three percentage points or whatever. Think about like a Sopranos so, mafia meeting, but it's just the algorithm. <laughs> right. And and the way the way that our government could do this, Richard Nixon did it very reluctantly, establish price controls. Also wage wage controls, too, but 
since wages are lagging behind uh, about uh, prices at this point, putting a uh, a wage and price uh, control structure, imposing it, sixty days, ninety days, one hundred and twenty days, whatever it is, that should happen. Mm. Nixon pioneered this. I, I heard an interesting podcast about like where the idea came from. It was floating around. It wasn't his idea. In fact, he ran on arguing against it. Uh, it was coming out of you know World War II. This was uh, in, into the Kennedy administration. This idea was kicking around, and he didn't want this to happen. Uh, but he ended up realizing like this needs to happen. The executive branch can just do it, or you can they put, need you Congress. Can, you can, uh, apparently, under certain like uh, emergency powers, you can do it without Congress's approval. Let's go then. In fact, on some level, I think it was to thwart Congress from doing it. Um, where they would have been a little bit more, remember, that was a, a, do, a Democratic-dominated uh, uh, Congress, and it would have put him on the hot seat. And I think he just sort of like, um, uh, I don't know if it was like a limited hangout type of situation, but uh, you could do price controls. And you could also do, um, you could do taxation. You'd have to go through Congress. You could do, uh, uh, you know, some type of windfall profit taxation, which would basically get rid of the incentive for creating such uh, massive uh, profits mm. rather they'll they'll make their money through volume instead of uh, huge price gouging markups but we are so like even this guy who realizes it's not wages he can't say corporate profits even though he knows it this is what uh, this is the dirty little secret and so the Fed does the only thing it can do, which is to use basically um, citizens, workers, in their capacity as consumers, as basically a tool to sort of like slowly, gently convince corporate CEOs that they can't get away with price gouging. Don't anymore. you love being used as leverage uh, in, in a standoff between corporate America? Well, especially when corporate America is like, oh no, everyone's going to be motivated to come work for us now. Yeah. Oh, don't do us like that. Like, right. I mean. That, right. It's a win-win for them. Yeah. Right. Uh, tails I win, uh, heads you lose. Yep. It's pretty bad. Um, <sighs> Fun half. <laughs> all right. Should we just do this last uh, one of the uh, number sure. Uh, seven? Sure. <clears throat> We're already seeing, you know, they're running hard on this, um, you know, uh, the Republicans are running on transphobia. It is really a beginning to have material impact on people's lives. Not just, um, not just trans kids. Uh, we see it impacting um, girls and women in women's sports and this and that because now you have to prove that you're a woman do you have too many male hormones? Let's see your um, let's see your sexual organs. Um, of course, it's having devastating effect on on trans kids. You've got in Michigan, other states. We've seen this uh, already pass where it is you basically outlawing parents being able to provide uh, gender affirming care for their trans kids. Here is another example coming from uh, the local ABC News affiliate in uh, a Michigan high school. Um, a student, her name was Evelyn Gonzalez, paints a, a mural for the local middle school. And you're not going to believe what happens next. And we begin tonight with the controversial painting by a Grant High School student. It's on a wall in the middle school building. And Pause it. Right there, you know society has gone off the rails. Yeah. Keep keep it up. Keep keep it up there so that people can also see the controversial mural that's going on there. If you're in high school or elementary school, you're going to notice a lot of those like uh, icons and those figures and this and that because it's for kids stuff. But there's something very dark going on there, ladies and gentlemen. And the um, the fundamentalists uh, who live in that area are going to find it for you. Decode it vigilantly. It's on a wall in the middle school building. And tonight, some parents complained to the school board about its messages. 
13 on your side's Nate Belt was at tonight's meeting and has details. I put my art up there to make people feel welcomed. That's how Grant High School student Evelyn Gonzalez describes this mural. She painted it inside the middle school's Teen Health Center, and parents are concerned about some of its content. Now this here is the mural in question that was a hot topic tonight at the school board meeting here at Grant Middle School. Now uh, the, some of the things that the parents were closely paying attention to included the trans flag on this t-shirt here, this symbol which the artist says comes from a video game, as well as this symbol here which she says is a Hispanic sign of protection. I feel like she did a really good job finding excuses to defend the things she put on. None of us are that stupid. Oh my God. Parents alleged the video game I got some bad news for you, lady. a depiction of Satan and that the hand symbol is demonic, with several even using the word witchcraft to describe it. That's not what I'm a part of, and that's not what I'm trying to put out there. As for the transgender flag, one parent implied it's a sickness. When adults pretend things that are like real life, it's a mental illness. We need counselors. We need the medication that's going to help bipolar disorder fix their brains. With another saying it's discriminatory against Christian beliefs. We and our administration should uh, embrace that and get all of this hate material out of our schools because it is hate material. Not everybody was opposed to the mural. One parent was appalled by some of the words used. I am a conservative, right-wing, gun-loving American but I have never seen more bigoted people in my life. Ooh. And wants to see more acceptance in her community. We have an array of people in this little town. And I'll be the first one to support our Christian families. <coughs> but we're not the only ones here. A student and friend of the artists who described themselves as queer says they were bullied throughout middle school and into high school. They say the mural makes them feel included. Maybe you should be more concerned with your children's behaviors instead of what art is on the wall. While some parents called for the mural to be removed or altered, Grant Public Schools' handbook includes a non-discriminatory policy, saying in part, any form of discrimination or harassment can be devastating to an individual's academic progress, social relationship, and or personal sense of self-worth. No decision was made on the future of the mural at Monday's meeting. In Grant's Nate Belt, 13 on your side. If you are under the impression that there has been some type of dramatic change in our culture where the trans ideology is taking over. Um, you need to start getting out more and, well, and start reading outside of the very narrow, uh, either right wing or I don't know, contrarian circles that you're reading and see what's happening in the country. The, the people that spoke at that school board meeting could not have been more caricatures of the kind of person that you know is speaking against trans kids and like inclusion of non-white people in a school board meeting. And you just notice how worked up they get about their own projection. They've never seen something so hateful. Really? Are you looking in the mirror? Because that's how it feels. It's just amazing. The The... I mean, and they're, they, they probably, they, I'm sure that they hate her for a variety of reasons, probably due to her ethnicity, because the, the idea that you would feel righteous in going to a school meeting to critique a child's art, piece of art on the why side. Why she's satanic. And why she's satanic to her face, um, in the, in the nurse's office, like you're deranged and, yeah. and you're hateful. Because there's something about her that makes them feel like, and, and of course, probably the fact that there was a trans flag um, and the conditioning from conservative media. But there's something about her, too, that makes them angrier. There's, there's the, I looked up that like three finger hand eye symbol. Uh, there's a Wikipedia. The Hamsa is a palm shaped amulet popular throughout North Africa and in the Middle East and is commonly used in jewelry and wall hangings. Depicting the open right hand, an image recognized and used as a sign of protection many times throughout history, the Hamsa has been traditionally believed to protect, to provide defense against the evil eye. So actually, right. if this is doing anything, it's protecting people from that those spooky thing. And here's the other thing who cares? Right. <laughs> yeah. Even if it was like, this is how you open the portal for trans demons, I'd be like, well, you know what? Let the kid express himself. Right. It's just a mural, folks. It's uh, just a mural. And, and when the mural says stay healthy in the middle of it, you know what healthy is code for. It's question your gender. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Even if you've never done it before. 
and of course all the furries up there there was like yeah the litter uh, box under the yeah yeah i mean this is the demons think healthy means injecting that 5g vaccine and and, and, you know uh, there are people out there who are this is the implications of even this like you know alarm of like i want to go back to when you know boys were boys and men were men and uh, girls were girls i mean this is like literally they were parodying this stuff 30 40, 50 60 years ago and all in the family for god's sakes and i know that you know 75 percent of our audience has no idea what i'm even talking about but there was like they were doing sitcoms where they would parody this attitude 50 years ago and it's coming back All right, let's a uh, couple of IMs and then we're out of here. Finish the week, ladies and gentlemen. Sam's tight pants. Biden Republican plan is mega MAGA trickle down. For the love of God, why can't we just say they're on side of corrupt, corrupt corporations and they're ripping off everyday Americans? It is, it, it's unbelievable. You know, Warnock touched on it a little bit in the debate, but he only said the word twice and it's not enough. Mm-hmm. You got to just keep hammering this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vermont Ben. How serious should we take the Federalist? Oh, yeah, you already asked that. Sam, if I don't pay my taxes, should I be put in jail over? Yes, uh, ultimately, yes. Um, Noah from Tampa. Hey, I've been trying to call in to talk about the trial against HCSO and the wrongful death of Andrew Joseph III. Can I call dibs on the first call? Yeah, try us on uh, Monday. Chris from Nashville. Matt Walsh is having his rally to end child uh, mutilation. This afternoon here in Nashville, the state capital, because Vanderbilt has transgender services that I myself use for gender confirmation uh-huh. surgery, and they're excellent. I only heard about this rally yesterday when attending our local Americans United for Separation of Church and State meeting by the fantastic Marissa Richmond. Um, if she's never been on the show before, she'd be an excellent guest interview. Marissa Richmond at the uh, Middle Tennessee State University. Tulsi uh, will be in attendance there. Really? <laughs> yep. Wow, she's busy. Getting busy. Arizona. Back, back on her old to, shit. Yeah, Carrie Lake. Now, uh... Maybe her dad can show up, too. Well... He, Is he dead? I don't know. Yeah, he seen, might be in, in service to the cult leader for... for the the Majewski Report. Have you seen uh, Fukuyama's latest piece in The Atlantic? Have not. I think, like, the history has ended again. I, I don't know. Did it end again? I think it's ended again. Oh, oh cool. Well, it, second it was, it second time's a charm. It, it ended, and then it didn't end, and now it's... It, but it turns out it's actually ended. So uh, Lord of the Rings. It's called Still the End of History. Southern Socialist. Did you hear about the suspension of Ethan Klein, Left His Best? Yes, I did. And it was ostensibly because um, he made a joke uh, that was sort of like, uh, if there was another Holocaust, um, he would like uh, uh, Ben Shapiro to go first. And, uh, you know, t- to me, that's just called being polite. Uh, Taloma Flink. Uh, happy casual Friday, folks. Glad you're feeling better. After Wednesday, I'm a, here in Britain. I'm glad the enlightened centrists in our media were able to help avert the disaster of Jeremy Corbyn treating poor people like human beings. Mm. Also, I saw that PragerU was accusing the left of being afraid of debates. I think the most ridiculous PragerU segment I've seen is where they, uh, when they do their keep politics out of sport routine. <laughs> That's also very funny because it's like against what they kind of do well, which is sort of like to burrow into these cultural niches and uh, like act normal. Um, and but when they say like actually, basketball players are just too woke now. You can just tell you, oh, you guys are just racist. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. Their example of a political sporting event was the '95 Men's Rugby World Cup, in which Nelson Mandela used for the express <laughs> political purpose, trying to unite South Africa after apartheid. The segment described the winning. South Africa team is mixed race with the exception of Chester Williams. The entire team was white. Isn't that the plot of Invictus? Mom, ma'am Cedar. Did you all see the story from the AP about the evangelical Marine officer who was abducted in an Afghan infant and took her to the U S horrific. Oh, Jesus. Benny P, uh, Sam campaign finance question. Uh, uh, I can't read this whole thing folks. It's long. A few months ago when Nomi announced she was running for a- New York assembly, you made a comment about not having her on the show regularly because she may be construed as an in-kind contribution as it re- relates to campaign laws. I wonder if you would have any insight as to how that would or should impact larger media organizations like Fox News who are explicitly and continuously boosting Republican Senate candidates and trashing their Democratic opponents on a nightly basis. Um, 
I, you know, I, I had that same question, but I didn't want to pay a campaign, uh, like lawyer to be honest with you, but someday we'll look into it. Chaotic insights, Sam, not long ago, I saw Fenton Muley singing the Septus Septipus song. And I knew I had to find out who the actor was that played him because he was hilarious. I found you on IDMB, uh, IMDB, and thought, oh, this guy is just some D-bag from Sex in the City and Newsland. <laughs> Years later, I'm watching the TYT on YouTube, and when the video starts and ends, MR Auto plays the next, and I hear Fenton yelling about politics with a Beastie Boys knockoff, making impossibly offensive Gandhi and Obama impressions. Skip ahead eight years, and I'm still gutted when I hear the news story and think, what would Michael's take have been? I get a bit choked up and I don't miss an episode of the live show. It also makes me super happy that Emma found a home where she can shine and grow. So I've been watching her since John and Anna on TYT University Think Tank. You've built a wonderful team here. I really appreciate what you guys do. Thank you. That's very sweet. All right. Five more. Judy Rulliani. Um, show the clip. Sam is uh, bulking up for his role in the new Inglorious Bastards movie. Sam, <laughs> will you gay marry me? Actually, you don't have a choice. I'm the husband now. <laughs> All right, well, wonderful. Uh, can I be a stay-at-home uh, husband or uh, uh, Sam's de minimis penis? Oh, it's been a while. Hey, Sam, how hard would it be uh, to set up a Hello Tushy to spray rubbing alcohol instead of water? And wouldn't that be a great idea? Jesus Christ! Pass, God. pass. <laughs> Benny boy, um, instead of freebie February, it should be February free. Okay, thank you. Australian. That's worse than me. So Trump could still run, got president from prison. Is that true? And people are also being arrested for voting. Come on, America. Mm. Oh, my effing God. Uh, Spocko. Fun fact, Oklahoma governor pushed to have Trump's super spreader rally in Tulsa, which led to confirmed fourfold increase in sickness and death from COVID. All uh, pre-vaccine. Thousands who died who didn't uh, attend. It's not just Herman Cain. And the final I am of the day. And you, sir. That's not it. Um, I should say, I know there was somebody who wanted a shofar for their, for their wedding anniversary today, or they just got married. This is for you. And the final I am of the day. Haldeman and Nixon were bitching about all in the family on the tapes. <laughs> Bradley, Matt, Emma, great job this week. See you folks on Monday. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. The truth and the life bar Finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere the choice is made For the option where you don't get paid Somehow I lost my drive Between the 101 and the 5 Do you know how far The detail takes you Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining Shifted 